Welcome to your Monday Night Raw review for April 1st, 2024. It is not April Fool's Day for much longer, less than half an hour. No April Fool's jokes here. It's always the uh, thing I hate most about this day. But we are kicking off the month of April here with the Go Home episode of Raw. That is what we had tonight. Not very far from where I am right now, actually. Here in Brooklyn, they were at the Barclays Center. They're setting all kinds of records. 13 consecutive sellouts, I believe, was the number. Something crazy like that. They're packing them in every single week. They had 15,000-plus at the Barclays Center tonight for the final Raw before WrestleMania 40. And it was a Monday Night Raw with a strong open, a commercial-free open with the Bloodline, which is entirely why they were commercial-free, I'm sure, in that first hour, and a red-hot closing angle, a classic... Old school wrestling beatdown angle to take us out of the show and into WrestleMania Saturday in the big tag team match with Rock and Roman Reigns taking on Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. So they opened strong, they closed strong. There were a few things in the middle of the show that I liked. I thought there was some good stuff in the middle, but there were also parts of that second and third hour that kind of died. Uh, and frankly, I think the commercial free first hour had a lot to do with that because, as I always say, be careful what you wish for, because you get a commercial-free first hour, or 50 minutes is really what it is. And then they just assault you an hour, two, and three, and so they're constantly coming back and immediately going back to commercial. It just kills the entire flow of the show. And that's what happened tonight. Not as good as last week's show. Last week's show was the best Raw of the entire year. One of the best Raws maybe in a lot longer than that. But they are selling this WrestleMania off of the back of the bloodline angle. They are selling it off of the strength of the stuff with The Rock and Roman Reigns and Cody challenging for the championship. And we got a bloodline rules main event on the show tonight. This was to give us a taste of what we are going to get on Sunday should Rock and Roman win in the tag team match on night one. They wanted to give you a sense of what we can expect in a bloodline rules match, which is like any other hardcore rules match in WWE. It's just... No disqualification, anything goes, people chant for tables, they bring tables out, anybody can run in, they're calling it bloodline rules. Uh, they're not really doing anything that's uh, outside the box here. But they teased that Seth Rollins would be going at it alone tonight, because it was going to be Seth Rollins against Solo Sokoa. But of course, bloodline rules, and no Cody Rhodes. After the angle that closed last week's show, Cody was left a bloody mess by The Rock, out of the parking lot in Chicago. And so tonight he was not medically cleared. There would be no Cody Rhodes, or so they wanted you to believe. Anybody who watches this show, anybody who knows anything about wrestling knows that they were setting up for Cody Rhodes to come out at the end of the show. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. He came out to the ring, and what did I say coming into tonight's show? Cody Rhodes, who never lifted a finger to even take a swing at The Rock on last week's show. The Rock just beat him and beat him and beat him and left him bloody. Cody Rhodes had to come into Barclay Center tonight like this man owed him money. He had to come out guns blazing. I don't know if you would say it was guns blazing, but he came out and he did the deal. He came out, he went right for the rock. Exactly what he had to do. Exactly the person that he should have made his target. And the rock bumped around for him. And the good thing is that the rock, I mean, as far as I could tell, he was moving around pretty well at the end of the show. He didn't tear anything. So that's a good sign. That's a very good sign. And so The Rock was bumping around for Cody Rhodes there a little bit. And unfortunately for Cody, the angle ended with both baby faces being whipped like dogs and left for dead by the final boss and the tribal chief. I'm glad that we got to see Cody get some shots off on The Rock. It was a must. 
He had to. Coming out of the show last week and the angle they did. Back-to-back, very strong, heel-heavy, but very strong closing angles the last two weeks. Something that we really have not seen a whole lot of in modern-day WWE. With a, with a heavy angle like that, let alone back-to-back weeks. Again, very old school in that way. Something that you would have seen on a pretty regular basis many, many years ago. And I don't just mean the blood that we got last week. I mean, that was part of it. But it's just classic old-school wrestling. And it works. There's a reason why it's, it was done this way for so long. There's a reason why you, know, you heard the fans tonight at the Barclays Center, right? Raining boos down upon The Rock and boos down upon Roman Reigns. That's the reaction that you want to go for there. Uh, and yet, in the same token, it was also the second week in a row that Cody Rhodes was left for dead. Two weeks in a row now. Now, I have been thinking that the play here going into WrestleMania was to have The Rock be the one to pin Cody Rhodes on night one. You set up bloodline rules on night two. Things play out, but you, you do it that way because you can bring it back at SummerSlam. You can bring it back months from now, and you can have a money match between Cody Rhodes and The Rock. I don't see how anybody could watch the television over the last month month plus, let alone the last two weeks worth of angles that they've done, and not think that this company isn't setting up for, or that they should be setting up for an eventual match between Cody and The Rock. Why wouldn't they do the match? The only thing stopping it from happening would be The Rock's schedule. He's not able to do it. That's the only thing. So they have set this match up. It would make sense to have Rock be the one to pin Cody in that match, and that way You could always circle back to it and say, hey, I beat you once, I can beat you again. You can have a match, you can have a title match. So that's what I figured the the play was going to be. But it's a little hard to take the idea, it's a little hard to stomach the idea that last week we had Rock leave him a bloody mess. Tonight we had Rock, the final shot, Rock whipping him with his belt in the middle of the ring. And then you go for the third week in a row. You go into WrestleMania and then have Rock pin Cody Rhodes. When you think of it like that, it's a little hard to take. It's a little hard to take. Even That's even with Cody, let's say, going on tonight, too, and beating Roman and, and winning the championship on Sunday. And that may be exactly what happens. You know, that may be exactly the way that it plays out. And look, six months from now, if they do the match, if they do the match at SummerSlam between The Rock and Cody Rhodes... Nobody is going to be sitting there going into that SummerSlam match thinking, man, you know, they really made Cody look weak in March going into WrestleMania. So by that point, it won't even matter, right? As long as as Cody is booked strong between now and then, you get to that point, you get to a SummerSlam match, people aren't going to be talking about the last two weeks' worth of angles they did here with these guys on Raw. Uh, I know he calls himself the final boss, but... If you're going to crown Cody, if he's going to be your champion, I do think it's a valid question to ask how much adversity is too much adversity. We've heard a lot about adversity. We've heard that word used a lot when it comes to Cody Rhodes. Going back to last year, why did Cody lose to Roman Reigns at WrestleMania 39? Oh, he needs more adversity. So we'll put him with Brock Lesnar. Every step of the way, Cody needs more adversity. At what point is it a little too much in the way of adversity? I think that's a question that's worth asking. And again, I'm not hating on the angle. I enjoyed the angle. I thought it was a strong angle. I thought that was exactly the sort of thing that they needed to do here on this go-home show. But you have to admit, it's been fairly lopsided up to this point. And that, that's not just with Rock. It's with Rock. It's with Roman. You know, the bloodline overall on the mic in these types of angles has been pretty dominant so far. They haven't really showed their ass yet as things have played out over the last several weeks. Uh, Lopsided enough, though, that the only logical conclusion, you watch these shows, and the only logical conclusion that you can come to is that Cody Rhodes is going to walk out the champion on Sunday. How can he not? How can he not? He lost last year. Second year in a row, he wins the Royal Rumble. He has been beaten down and beaten down and left for dead and beaten down. And he masculated on the microphone. Every step of the way, they've been, they've been doing this. They've been setting things up 
for him to overcome all of this adversity and win the championship. Can you imagine if after all of this, Cody Rhodes goes into WrestleMania this weekend and does not win the title? He loses for the second straight year? And I'm not even saying that it's impossible. It's very possible to conceive of the possibility that that could happen. And they could think, oh boy, well, we may as well try to milk this for another six to 12 months. Shit, we can get another year's worth of bloodline story and Cody trying to overcome adversity out of it. But this weekend is the most important weekend in the career of Cody Rhodes. This weekend is, and I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say this, this weekend is a make or break weekend for him in terms of him being taken seriously as a credible top babyface in this company. It all comes down to Saturday and Sunday, more so Sunday, but it all comes down to this weekend. They either elevate him to the top of the mountain and they put the torch in his hand or they beat him, they cut the rope, and he falls all the way back down to the bottom of the mountain. That's really what it all boils down to this weekend. But this being the final Raw before Mania, now that we have finally reached this point, right, we're less than a week away, I can say that the, the build overall to this year's WrestleMania has been very good. And there was a lot made of what happened last month when Rock came back and Cody stepped aside, right? We all remember that. Cody stepped aside. It was going to be Rock and Roman at WrestleMania. And then things changed and Rock went heel and they had the thing in Vegas and he slapped Cody and we got like old school Rock back. And it's been a lot of fun seeing this side of the Rock as compared to what he would normally do when he would pop up on TV. But you still had a fair number of people who said, you know, this was all part of the plan. They planned this out from the moment that Rock came back. This is what we're going to do, even though it didn't make any sense at all with Cody winning the Royal Rumble if they knew that it was going to be Rock and Roman. Didn't make a lick of fucking sense. But there were still people trying to convince themselves that it was all part of the plan from day one. Now, today, ESPN had an article, and it's very good, and you should all check it out. It's a very long article talking about how the company pivoted away from their original plans to where we are now. And in fact, the original plan was exactly what it looked to be, which was Cody Rhodes against Roman Reigns at WrestleMania. And then they decided, no, 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 no. We're going to go with Rock and Roman because that's the bigger match. And then they had the backlash from the fans. And to Triple H's credit, as it, as it mentions in the story, it was his idea. It was his call to call an audible and say, look, this is a bad idea. We may have made a mistake here. So let's all put our heads together and try to figure out a plan B, how we can salvage this, and we can turn this into something even better, in their eyes, even better than it was originally going to be. And that's how this all came about. And to his credit, Rock, you know, he went heel, which I didn't think he would do. I really didn't. After all these years at this stage of the game and all the different endeavors that he has and everything, I said, well, heel Rock. I mean, that's a thing of the past. But we've had a heel rock, and they pivoted back to Cody and Roman, and that was the right move to make. Now, we can, you know, quibble about certain angles that they've done and, and Cody not getting enough in this angle or enough in that angle, right? I've talked about that myself. But here we are now less than a week away from WrestleMania. I am excited. I am genuinely excited to see what they are going to do on Saturday and Sunday, and not only for the main events. I'm looking forward to Gunther and Sami Zayn. I'm looking forward to Becky Lynch and Rhea Ripley. I mean, there are several matches on this WrestleMania card. Drew McIntyre and Seth Rollins. Another plan that went up in smoke by his own admission with Ariel Helwani today. CM Punk said, to his knowledge, the original plan was going to be him and Seth. Which, again, I think we all knew. For the World Heavyweight title of WrestleMania. It's, it's actually pretty incredible when you look back. I mean, they're going to be able to write a book on this one day. <laughs> They'll do a documentary series on Peacock about all of the plans for this year's WrestleMania that got blown up, and how we ended up where we ended up. How would this WrestleMania card look right now if Punk had not gotten hurt in the Royal Rumble? How would this WrestleMania card look like if the crowd didn't react online the way they did when Cody stepped aside and Rock took the match? How would that have affected Seth? Because the idea was Cody still won the Rumble, then it's going to be Cody and Seth. What happens with Punk? I don't know. It's one big fucking mess. I don't know what the WrestleMania card ultimately would have looked like, but it's pretty interesting to think about. 
But I am looking forward to WrestleMania. I think they've done a good job overall with the build. And uh, we're going to get into everything here with this go home show tonight. Before we even get into Raw, we do have some breaking news unrelated to Raw and unrelated to WWE, but I do feel like it needs to be mentioned here because this actually broke during the show tonight and it concerns AEW and something that we are not really accustomed to hearing about when it comes to AEW. Certainly with WWE, under Vince McMahon in the past, there were plenty of mass waves of releases. And as part of those mass waves of releases, a lot of names that would get released that just would make you scratch your head. In this case, I can't honestly say that I'm scratching my head about these names, but it's still a pretty shitty situation. AEW released 10 talents earlier today. And Sean Ross Sapp, I think, broke the initial story. PW Insider also reported on this. I'm going to read the list of names to you. I believe this is the final list. At least it is as far as today. Doesn't mean there can't be more in the future. Anthony Henry. Not a major name in AEW, and you probably didn't even see him much on AEW television. It might have been more Ring of Honor. The shitty thing about this, though, is Anthony Henry is the one who got his jaw broken. This was within the last few weeks. I think it was in an independent match. And he got his jaw broken. I think he had surgery on it. Or he was going to have surgery on it. And then I think maybe he didn't have to. But he got released. And I certainly hope that it's something that he himself requested. Because if not, uh, that's pretty shitty to release the guy when he just got his jaw broken. And he's sitting at home hurt. So he's gone from the company. The boys are gone. Dalton Castle's boys. I think Dalton Castle lost them on TV in a match a few weeks ago. The boys are no more. They were released. Stu Grayson of the Dark Order. He is gone. Jose the Assistant. He's gone. Gravity. Yes, Gravity is gone from AEW. George Joel. Parker Boudreaux. The former uh, Harlan from NXT. Slim J is no longer with the company. And I'll be honest with you, out of all of these names, this last one is probably the one that shocked me the most. I mean, shock maybe is a little strong, but this one is the one that surprised me the most. Uh, Dasha. Dasha, the ring announcer, is no more. I think of all the names on this list, she might have been the one that probably got the most airtime on AEW television. You know, with her, with her voice. So... She is no longer with the company. Again, we don't normally hear about this sort of thing uh, with AEW. Tony Khan signs people and signs them and signs them and signs them and just holds on to them. Unless there's a disciplinary reason for him to let go of somebody, which they've done a few times uh, over the last few years. Uh, but it's rare. But I think as he continues to sign people, you know, a lot of us have said there's going to come a day of reckoning where we're going to start to see this type of thing happen with his company. Whether he wants to do it or not, I mean, you can only sign so many people. You don't have spots for all of them. Some of them might request their release if they're not being used and they're not happy. We don't know. Maybe that happened in some of these cases. In other cases, he's going to have to at some point make a decision about who to keep and who to get rid of. And it looks like he's finally making decisions about who to get rid of, but it's still a shitty situation. Uh, I think it always sucks to see people lose their jobs. Uh, it sucks. And again, the Anthony Henry thing, uh, I certainly hope that was something that uh, came from his end, because if not, uh, that's pretty fucked up. This is your Monday Night Raw review for April 1st, 2024. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. I believe I made the goal 450, right? 450 likes is the goal for our Be The Booker segment tonight. Super Chats are open. This is a very busy week, uh, even today, just with everything going on. I thought today would be the quietest day of the week. Fuck was I thinking. Every single time I think that, oh, this is going to be a quiet day. Oh, this is going to be a quiet week. I, I end up paying the price for it. Uh, today was anything but. And it's only going to get busier as the week goes on. Now, I mentioned I'm going to be uh, actually doing some stuff tomorrow afternoon between 4 and 5 p.m. Uh, with the Fox Sports radio affiliate there in Philly. Uh, I'll be remoting in, talking WWE and talking WrestleMania in the afternoon. So uh, that'll be very cool. Of course, we have Dynamite coming up on Wednesday night. 
Uh, but I also have the opportunity to do something very cool. I'm going to be doing my WrestleMania predictions for this weekend, uh, recording them on Thursday in Philadelphia at the Duncan Music Lounge, which is at the iHeart Studios uh, there in Philly. And I'm very much looking forward to it. I'm going to actually go through the uh, lineups real quick because now we know what the lineups are uh, for each night. We have the lineups here for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, but I don't know if you saw it earlier today on social media. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, mention this. Not only am I doing the WrestleMania predictions on Thursday, but joining me will be the world's strongest man, WWE Hall of Famer himself. He's been in a few WrestleManias in his day. Mark Henry is going to be in studio joining me as we talk about WrestleMania, and I go through my predictions. We'll loop him in there as well. We'll get some of his thoughts and predictions, too. I'm very much looking forward to this. Uh, this is going to be very cool. And so that is coming up on Thursday, 1 o'clock. And uh, I don't know exactly what the... Uh, broadcast situation is going to be, but I will at some point, hopefully later that day, uh, be able to get the video up for all of you here on the YouTube channel. So you all can uh, check it out yourselves. Uh, one quick note here, because uh, I have mentioned the fact that uh, it is a very small space. We are going to be able to have some people there with us, uh, but not that many. And some people have expressed an interest in being there. Uh, if you are one of those people, you need to get in touch with me whether it's on Twitter or by email, the Solomonster, the Solomonster at gmail.com. Let me know if you are planning on attending, would like to attend. Uh, I need your name. I need your email address. And you got to get that to me ASAP. So uh, just a little FYI there. But yeah, looking forward to being with Mark Henry and going over some WrestleMania predictions on Thursday. Got to be careful not to piss this guy off. You know, they call him the world's strongest man for a reason. I don't want to get on his bad side there. I mentioned that we have the WrestleMania lineups, so let me run through this real quick here. Night one is on Saturday, and we have currently scheduled, of course, we know the tag team match is the main event. Rock and Roman Reigns take on Cody Rhodes and Seth Rollins. Becky Lynch on night one will be challenging uh, Rhea Ripley for the Women's World Championship. We have Gunther defending the Intercontinental title on night one against Sami Zayn. Jimmy and Jay going to go one-on-one. -on -one. I've been saying for a while, I think Jimmy and Jay should open the show. Uh, but then Becky Lynch over the past week has talked about wanting to open night one herself. So it's probably going to be one or the other. Uh, I just like the idea of opening with another brother versus brother match like they did back in 94. I think that would be cool. We have the undisputed tag team title ladder match. It's a six-pack challenge. That is on night one. Also, we have Jade Cargill. Bianca Belair and Naomi taking on Asuka, Kairi Sane, and Dakota Kai. And Rey Mysterio and Dragon Lee taking on Santos Escobar and Dominic Mysterio. So that's night one. That leaves on night two both world title matches. So we have the undisputed WWE title match between Cody Rhodes and Roman Reigns. We have Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre for the world heavyweight title. We've got Io Sky defending her WWE women's title against Bayley. Logan Paul defending the U.S. title against Randy Orton and Kevin Owens. L.A. Knight taking on AJ Styles. And they have added a Philadelphia street fight with Bobby Lashley and the Street Profits taking on Karrion Cross and AOP. So that is seven matches on night one. That is six matches on night two, including both of the men's title matches. And so I assume that's because this way that they can get more time. Uh, I think that's perfect. I think they nailed it as far as the number of matches on each night. Not too many, not too few. Seven on night one, six on night two, 13 in total. Uh, not counting if they you know, were to add anything to the pre-show. Right now they have nothing on the pre-shows except a lot of this, a lot of talking. Uh, the WrestleMania Andre Battle Royal is on SmackDown the night before. Couldn't find time for it, I guess. They got two two-hour pre-shows on, on each night, and uh, they're doing that on SmackDown on Friday. Now, earlier today on Instagram, this was expected, uh, but they did not make it official until today. The Rock announced that he will be inducting his late grandmother, Leah Maivia, into the WWE Hall of Fame this Friday. 
She is the last inductee for the class of 2024. He said, I am honored to announce that I will be inducting my grandmother, Leah Maivia, into the Hall of Fame. One of the first ever female promoters of pro wrestling. She was a trailblazer, a protector of our family. She was the real final boss. So The Rock's grandmother joins Paul Heyman, Bull Nakano, the U.S. Express, Thunderbolt Patterson, and Muhammad Ali as the class of 2024. That is going to be airing on Peacock immediately after SmackDown on Friday night. But tonight, it ain't Friday night yet. It's Monday night. And tonight, the show opened with a recap of last week's angle with Rock attacking Cody, leaving him on the ground outside in the pouring rain in Chicago, bloodying him up. Michael Cole told us that Cody was not medically cleared to be on the show tonight. Uh, Pat McAfee, though, said that he would be at WrestleMania this weekend. I sure as hell hope so, given the fact that the man is in both main events on night one and night two. That's the only thing I was thinking about tonight. When they announced that Seth Rollins, the guy who just came back from a, a sprained or, no, he had torn, right? A torn MCL. I think it was a partial tear of his MCL. Only came back a few weeks ago. You are five days out from WrestleMania. And not only did they put Seth Rollins in a match tonight on TV, they put him basically in, in like an Extreme Rules match. <laughs> we had tables. He took one bump, actually threw a table. It looked like he smacked the back of his head pretty hard as he went through the table. And all I thought was, because they take you know, their concussion protocol very seriously, you know, what, what would happen if Seth went out there tonight and got concussed? I'm sure he would do everything to hide it. But let's say he got concussed and they knew about it, and he was out. He's got two matches this weekend. So they took a risk by putting him out there in that main event tonight with, with all the weapons and all the plunder and everything. Uh, but yeah, I, I think Pat McAfee uh, saying that Cody is expected to be at WrestleMania was kind of a given, given his uh, position on the show. So The Rock was out to the ring to kick off the commercial-free first hour, and he brought something classic back with him tonight. The Rock showed up in his classic cowskin vest. That is the same vest that you are seeing right there, the same vest he wore 24 years ago. When he was the WWE champion, the spots, everything was in the same exact position. He's had that fucking thing in his closet for 24 years. And finally, he had a chance to dust it off and put it back on tonight. So he came down to the ring. That's a good looking belt right there. I, I'm, I'm a winged eagle guy myself, although I have a replica of that one too. The big eagle is cool. But I'm just looking at that title over his shoulder compared to what they have today. And uh, boy, there is no comparison. Where did they go wrong when it came to their title designs? Hey, you know what? If Cody wins on Sunday, maybe, maybe, maybe Cody can convince them. I know they love their big giant logo belts. Maybe Cody could convince them to uh, you know, kind of upgrade the winged eagle and bring, bring in a new belt. See, another reason to root for Cody this week. Get rid of the big uh, mustard belt. So the fans cheered for The Rock. They were very happy here in Brooklyn to see him. And then they booed when the music stopped. He said he made that boy bleed. And the crowd started giving The Rock the what treatment. And he fed into it. Like his cadence and everything. And I hate when they do this because all that does is encourage these people. Don't do that. Don't encourage them. So he said the only thing missing from that weight belt after he wiped Cody's blood on it are the tears of Mama Rhodes. He said the Cody crybabies did not like what he did to Cody, and then he threw it to some fan videos from YouTube. Uh, YouTube and, and Instagram of little kids crying their eyes out after last week's angle at the end of the show. Like, little kids watching Raw who thought Cody was severely injured. There was one little girl, I mean, she had tears coming down her cheeks, Little snot bubbles coming out of her nose. And her mom is like, what's wrong? And she said, Cody's dead. Cody's dead. She thought Cody died at the end of Raw last week. And The Rock could not hide his, his smile. He could not hide his pleasure at all of these uh, little kids who were traumatized last week. Rock said, look, I get it. 
I'm a girl dad too, right? He's got a he's got a few girls. And then Rock advised those parents to put their kids in front of the TV. Said Uncle Rock said that there were moments in life when a man had to do what a man had to do. But there are moments in life where people talk shit when they shouldn't be talking shit. And now he's got to beat that punk ass down. Over and over and over again. So the fans cheered. They chanted Rocky. Apparently uh, not a lot of parents in the crowd. So he says, we're all feeling the mana right now. We're all feeling the mana. Are you feeling the mana? I'm not feeling the mana. I don't know. Maybe you're feeling the mana. Because professional wrestling, he says, is cool again. I guess professional wrestling is cool for another week until he disappears, and then it won't be so cool anymore. He goes, the ratings are skyrocketing because of The Rock. Tonight, the fans in Brooklyn have set a record for the largest gate ever. Not only in Brooklyn, but I'm pretty sure, like, legit, tonight was the largest gate for any episode of Monday Night Raw in the history of the show going all the way back here in New York to 1993. Considering how long that show has been on the air for, that's very impressive. And he goes, there's one reason why. Because finally, blood was shed. Finally, we are five days out from WrestleMania, and finally, the final boss has come back to Brooklyn. But Brooklyn, he said, The Rock did not come alone. And they played Roman Reigns' music. I couldn't believe it myself. The champion actually showed up for work. There he was. Out comes Roman Reigns. Paul Heyman is with him. Solo Sokoa, Jimmy Uso. Michael Cole mentioned the A&E documentary, uh, which I think Paul Heyman was the executive producer on. Aired last night on A&E, all about Roman Reigns. I have not seen it yet. But in the documentary... <clears throat> He made the comment, Roman did, that if he loses his title at WrestleMania, he's gone. That's it. If he loses the title on Sunday, he's leaving. On Saturday night, he's going to make some history regardless. On Saturday night, Roman Reigns is going to tie Hulk Hogan for the greatest number of WrestleMania main events at eight. Then on Sunday, he's going to break the record. He's going to break his own record and beat Hogan and have nine WrestleMania main events to his name. See? So for all the people out there who love to talk about the Hogan record, you don't have to wait until September, you see? He's going to break Hogan's record this weekend. So you can shut up about September. <laughs> There's your Hogan record. You happy? Yeah, yeah, you're happy, aren't you? You're happy, the rock, yeah. I'm so tired of hearing about this Hogan shit in September. He's got to pass Hogan. He's got to beat Hogan's record. Yeah, he's got to beat Hogan's record and become number three on the all-time list. Shut the fuck up. He'll break Hogan's record this weekend. So at this point, we were 20 minutes into the show. Nothing has happened yet. <laughs> the rock came out. He said some words. Roman Reigns came out to the ring. Nothing has actually happened yet on this show. We were 20 minutes in, so you know, you know exactly why we had a commercial-free first hour. So Roman Reigns told Brooklyn to acknowledge him. The fans yeeted him. He said, no yeet, and if they continue with it, he's going to leave. He said he was trying to put fa his family over it. He told the fans to shut it. He's been putting his family over for three and a half years. But he said, I'm trying to put my family over. He told everybody to shut up. Then he thanked The Rock because this is going to be the easiest WrestleMania of his life. A tag team match to determine the stipulations for Sunday night. He goes, I mean, come on. He said they're going to smash those fools, and then it's bloodline rules on Sunday, and they're going to have their way with Cody. So thank you, cousin. But then he went above and beyond, he said. The Rock went above and beyond, as he usually does, and he made that boy bleed. And Cody's not fit. For leadership, he's been trying to tell us. He goes, Cody, he's a politician. He's not fit to be in my shoes. He's lucky to be here. Because when they started making this thing cool again in 2020, he said Cody was off somewhere else doing a whole lot of nothing. It's been a rough day for the AW Shade. 
And they threw a little bit more out there here in this segment. He said, this is their mountain. They run this business, and on Sunday, it won't be more crystal. And then he was interrupted by Seth Rollins. And they were expecting him to come out from the back. Seth Rollins did not come up through the back. He started coming down the stairs through the crowd like his old Shield days. Although back then, he was wearing the, uh, what was it, the Kevlar vest, I guess, that he was, uh, the flak jacket that he was wearing. Which, I, I'd rather he have the flak jacket. I don't know what the fuck he wears today, but it wasn't the flak jacket. He's traded that, he's traded that in for whatever the hell he, he's out there wearing any given week. So Seth said that Rock crossed the line last week. Rock crossed the line, and now it's time for a fight. And he's not talking about WrestleMania in five days. No. No, he's talking about a fight tonight. So here's what he's thinking. Biggest WrestleMania of all time this weekend. Tonight, biggest Raw of all time. And the fans in Brooklyn deserve the biggest main event in Raw history. Seth Rollins, one-on-one -on -one with the final boss, The Rock. And everybody in the crowd went wild. To the point where it was clear, Seth, the next part of his promo, when we inevitably realized we, were, we would not be getting Seth and The Rock, he was going to say, or it could be me and Roman, right? He couldn't even get the words out to continue. They were still so loud. And they were going wild at the suggestion that they might actually get to see Seth and The Rock tonight. But he said uh, he didn't think that DJ had the ball. So he would be fine also with wrestling Roman Reigns tonight. He would even let them name the stipulation. We could do whatever you want. You want bloodline rules. You want to do a ladder match. You want to do a first blood match since that's your thing. He says... Who's got the balls? Rock called him a punk, said that he challenges the final boss. Did he not see what The Rock did to his partner last week? Beat his brains in so bad he's got brain damage. He goes, you don't want none of that. You ain't gonna fight The Rock, boy. He goes, you ain't gonna fight Roman Reigns, boy. He said, you're a tough, crazy son of a bitch. The Rock knows it. You're not fighting us, but The Rock has always got a plan. That's when Solo Sokoa stepped up. This poor fucker. He steps up, and the fans did not like that. Solo says, Seth's not fighting the tribal chief tonight or the final boss. He's fighting him tonight. And the fans really didn't like that. And why would they? This man is 0 for 34 since beating John Cena. You know, you would think that somebody who goes in there and beats someone the caliber of star that John Cena still is, right? I know he hasn't been active in a while. You know, Cena's kind of fallen off if you watched his last few matches, but he's still John Cena. And you would think that a win over John Cena should mean something. Austin Theory got a win over John Cena. It meant nothing. Solo Sokoa got a win over John Cena. It meant nothing. Maybe Cena should just go into Super Cena mode and just beat everybody. Because apparently, people beating him is having the opposite effect. <laughs> this man has been cursed ever since he got that win. It's like, wow, what a win, right? That'll carry him into WrestleMania. This man can't win a match to save his life. We didn't even get an outcome at the end of the main event tonight. We just got a no contest. You would think Solo would want that win so badly that he would do everything to make sure he got that win. Apparently, he didn't care. So The Rock said that it would be the biggest main event of all time, and it would be Bloodline Rules. And that concluded the opening segment 35 minutes into this show. He says that it would be the biggest main event in the history of Raw. Well, it, it, it was April Fool's Day. I, that's all I could think of. I said, it is a, he is saying this, it is April Fool's Day. And so it kind of makes sense that you would make a stupid comment like that. You know what? April Fool's Day reminds me. I didn't even realize April Fool's Day, same day as WrestleMania 17, which may truly be the greatest main event in the history of WrestleMania. Some people would say that. I don't, I don't know if I would say that. It's, it's up there. But yeah, that was April 1st, back in 2001. Legendary show. Top to bottom, best WrestleMania of all time. I like the opening segment. I like the opening segment. The fans in Brooklyn were red hot for it. 
And how could they not be? I mean, you had a lot of star power in this. They had Rock and Roman in the ring together, which we don't get every single week. Uh, Rollins came out. He's the champion on the show. But just Rock being out there. I mean, it, it's again, he just, it, it just, he cast this huge shadow over everything. And when he's out there and he's got the music and he's got the vest and everybody is just going nuts because when he walks in, he just is at a level of star power that nobody else is, including Roman Reigns. Nobody else in this company, nobody else in wrestling, I don't care what company you work for, has that level of star power just by walking into the room. Not Roman Reigns, not John Cena if he came back, not even Cody, not Punk. Nobody has that kind of aura that The Rock has just by walking out there. So, of course, the crowd's going to go nuts for him. We don't know how many more times we're going to see him on TV in segments like this. This could be it this weekend. I would think we're going to get Rock on either Raw next Monday or SmackDown next Friday. There has to be some kind of fallout from whatever's going to happen on that night two main event. So I think we're going to get Rock next week on at least one of the shows. After that, he may disappear again. He's got a movie coming up in May. He's flying off somewhere. I, who knows? After WrestleMania, how many times we're going to see The Rock? So, of course, people want to pay money to come and see him because this may be their only shot. But, again, I, I thought that the uh, the segment was very effective and they were clearly setting up a big angle with Cody for the end of the show. They replayed part of Ariel Helwani's interview from earlier today with Rhea Ripley on the MMA Hour. <laughs> the much less talked about part of Ariel's show today, where Becky Lynch called in, called uh, Ariel on his phone while he was talking to Rhea, and he held up the phone, and Becky was FaceTiming. And then Becky actually showed up in person. She was there. And she came into the studio, and she had to be pulled away from Rhea. Becky gave her a shove, and she was very upset that Rhea would talk about her family and talk about her daughter trying to get her attention, trying to get under her skin. So Becky was very upset. Now they come back live, and Kathy Kelly is in the back and trying to get Becky to comment on what happened earlier today. And Becky said that she would be out in the ring later if Rhea wants to answer the call. We had Finn Balor, Damian Priest, Dominic Mysterio, and J.D. McDonough of the Judgment Day taking on the New Day and DIY, two of the teams challenging for the tag titles at WrestleMania this weekend. Michael Cole specified both sets of tag team titles, the Raw belts and the SmackDown belts, will both be suspended from the uh, ceiling, or, well, whatever. I guess it's uh, <laughs> open-air stadium. They will be suspended above the ring. And in order to win the match, the match will end when both sets of tag team belts have been pulled down. So they are setting the table to have two different teams pull down two different belts and to potentially split the belts coming out of WrestleMania. Now, maybe they just want you to think that, but that clearly is what they are setting the table for. It's a very real possibility. I am still not convinced that the tag divisions on either show individually are strong enough to have two different separated sets of tag team belts. They have made inroads in the tag team division. Things have improved, but they could still use a few strong teams. And I don't know that splitting them right now, frankly, is, is the best idea, but I think that may be what we are in for coming out of Mania. Now, Balor had a welt uh, on his head. He got hurt at one of the live events against New Day this weekend. Uh, it was on his forehead over his eye. There was a very scary spot early in this match. Johnny Gargano went for a suicide dive. It was right out. Uh, in front of where the announcers sit. And he hit Dom with a suicide dive, basically lawn darted himself face first into the ground, right into the mats. He almost collided with the side of the announce desk. But I mean, he took a face first plant into the ground. And it looked like at the very last second, you know, he was able to kind of maneuver himself in a way where he didn't break his neck. But that could have ended very badly. Uh, thankfully, he was okay. This match did not go uh, that much longer. It ended with Priest giving Champa a razor's edge and then pinning him. That gives the Judgment Day a momentum win going into the match at WrestleMania. 
Uh, the thought did cross my mind. I'm not going to lie. Uh, watching this after the opening segment and then seeing Damian Priest here, the thought did cross my mind that in the very, very unlikely scenario that Cody did not show up at the end of the show, that we could have had a money in the bank cash in tonight. When people least expected it, five days before WrestleMania, and The Rock is out there, and he has said in recent weeks, if Seth keeps running his mouth, right, I have the power, I'm on the board, that title you've got, I can make it go away. And I thought there was a small chance that maybe that would happen with uh, Priest at the end of the show. No Cody there to save Seth. He ends up losing his title, but then I, I kind of smacked myself back to reality here because it wouldn't have made any sense. I mean, you have Damian Priest going into a tag team ladder match on Saturday. It would just wreak total chaos with the card. You know, you've got a world heavyweight title match planned already with Rollins and McIntyre. This guy's in a tag team ladder match. It just wouldn't have made any sense. Uh, but the thought did occur to me that maybe uh, they were setting Seth up for trouble at the end of the show. That did not happen. Could happen this weekend, though. Backstage, we had Roman Reigns and The Rock. Solo was standing there. He was looking at his thumb. He was getting ready to... Take Seth on later in the show. And Roman was all smiles, and he told Rock, Solo's got this on lockdown. I'm going to split. He goes, I've already fulfilled my contractual obligations. He didn't say this, but like he, he's like, I've already fulfilled my contractual obligations. I'm going to get out of here so I can get home and sleep in my own bed. Right? Showed up, did the bare minimum. I'm ready to get out of here. He goes, I got a speech to write. And this is when we learn that uh, Roman Reigns is going to be doing the induction speech for Paul Heyman uh, this Friday at the Hall of Fame. I was hoping it would be Punk. Roman, though, makes sense. It wasn't going to be Brock, so <laughs> come on. It wasn't going to be Brock, and you got, you got Tommy Dreamer. Like, who gives a fuck? Like, Roman Reigns is the one who's been running around with this guy for the last three and a half years. So I'm not surprised that they have him doing the speech. I think it's fine. So he walked off, and Paul Heyman, he thanked the final boss. He gave The Rock a kiss on the hand, and then he went off to go follow Roman. So we were led to believe that Roman Reigns was done for the night. And then after this, we got an Oscar-worthy vignette from the Performance Center. This was filmed, I believe this was earlier today, with Chad Gable training Sami Zayn for his big match at WrestleMania this Saturday against Gunther. They had uh, Sami and Chad watching some film on him. Then they showed that uh, Sami was in the gym working out. Then he was in the ring working out. Sami was exhausted after throwing around some opponents. Then Gable got in the ring, and Chad Gable snuck up behind him and put him in a sleeper hole. And Sammy tapped out, and he was very upset by this. And he goes, dude, what the hell? He goes, what the hell was that for? And Gable asked Sammy if he thought that uh, Gunther was going to care that you're exhausted. Do you think he's going to give a shit that you're exhausted in your match? He goes, you got to be ready. you got to be prepared. And Sammy said, because he wanted him to run the drill all over again. And Sammy said, no, I'm not doing it. And then he asked Gable if he was trying to burn him out a week before his match, Sammy asked if Gable uh, didn't think he was good enough. And Gable said Zayn was more than good enough to beat Gunther. He said Sammy may have entered WrestleMania last year when he had his hunger. He's not hungry enough now. He's trying to get this man to rediscover the hunger that he had a year ago when he went in there with Kevin Owens and they beat the Usos to win the tag team titles. And he goes, something is holding Sammy back. He goes, what is it? What is the problem here? And Sammy didn't want to tell him. And he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And then finally, Sammy Zayn blurted out, I'm afraid, okay? Literally giving the Rocky Three speech from the beach. The speech from the beach with Adrian. I'm afraid. Like basically doing a reenactment here. He goes, I am afraid that I'm going to let everybody down, including my wife and including my son. I don't want to see my wife front row at ringside like she was last year. Remember Elimination Chamber? I don't want to look over and see her crying her eyes out again. I don't want to disappoint the people that matter most to me. Gable said he understands that better than anybody. 
And Sammy said that Gable looked him in the eye and said that he didn't think he could beat Gunther. And Gable said that he was telling Sammy what he needed to hear. And he said they needed to prove everybody wrong. So Sammy went back to training and he threw Gable off when Gable came in again to try to put him in a sleeper hole. He threw him down. So he had mastered his training. Look, did they rip off Rocky? Yes, they did. Was it hokey as all hell? Yes, it was. This was still great. I thought this was a great segment here. See, I, I'm more of a Rocky IV guy myself. Like, I, I like Rocky III, but I, I'm more Rocky IV. You know, with Drago and that whole hearts on fire, you know, the whole thing. And on that note, I actually got an email during the show from one of our listeners here. I got an email from Jeremy, and I want to give him a shout out because I was actually thinking along the same lines watching this. But he wrote in, and he was asking, he said, you know, what if Sammy is playing the Apollo Creed role? What if Sammy is playing the Apollo role, not the Rocky role? And Gunther is Drago, or Drago, and Chad Gable is actually Rocky in this scenario. And he said, what if at WrestleMania, Gunther beats Sammy and proceeds to get excessive after the bell, you know, beating him down, which causes Chad Gable, who's out there in his corner, to get in the ring and go face-to-face -face with Gunther, leading to one more match to avenge Sammy and avenge his daughter and finally end Gunther's reign as the Intercontinental Champion. I would love it. I have no idea if that's the direction they're actually going in. Probably not. But you, you would have to think, though, you know, Chad Gable being involved still in this story, what's the payoff for him? Like, he's involved for, for a reason here. Like, if he helps Sammy win the title then I, I guess the story then would shift to him going after Sammy, and then he could feud with Sammy for the title. But then there's still this other story with Gunther that's unresolved. So, like, what, what's the end game for him? Uh, I don't know, but, you know, I would, I would prefer that over a swerve and him turning heel on Sammy, which is also a possibility. Uh, I don't know, but I, I like the idea, though. And no, that doesn't mean Sammy dies. <laughs> it's not going to cradle Sammy's head in his arms at WrestleMania. Although it would be fucking badass if uh, Gunther stands there and goes, if he dies, he dies. Uh, yeah. that, that would be pretty badass. Backstage, Rhea Ripley was in the Judgment Day clubhouse speaking to the crew when Santos Escobar, Angel, and Humberto, and Electra Lopez arrived and were greeted very warmly by Dominic. Priest pulled Dom aside and said, look, we gave you our blessing to do your business at WrestleMania, to tag with these guys, to tag with Santos, take on your dad. This, though, this is too much. Rhea said that uh, she would go talk to Priest because he walked off. She would go talk to him. But she also reminded Dom, look, communication, you got to let us know these things. Communication is key. And then Dominic uh, formally introduced the two factions, and then he invited Escobar to play darts. And so they played darts as they cut away. I wonder, you know, would they have uh, Dominic leave the Judgment Day coming out of this and end up joining Legado del Fantasma? Because it does feel to me like we, we're, we're approaching the end here. I mean, it, the Judgment Day stuff, I mean, the Bloodline stuff has been going on for three and a half years, and they have found a way to sustain it the entire time. I, I don't know how much more juice there is left in, in, in the bottle, though, with the Judgment Day. The one thing I really don't want them to do I feel like it would be a sin to split up Rhea and Dom. Like, in some way, you want to keep them together. Or if we get to a point where they're really no longer together on screen, you don't, you don't want to split them. I think you always want to maintain that on-screen relationship there. There's, there's just there's too much chemistry there to ruin that. But I do wonder if they would take him out of one faction, put him in the other, if that's a possibility. Sami Zayn was out next for a rematch with Bronson Reed coming off of his loss to Bronson last week. Reed was in control until Sami hit a sunset flip powerbomb off the ropes for a two count. That's how Sami beat him in the gauntlet match a few weeks ago. Reed came back with a Death Valley driver for two and then they went to commercial. After that, Zayn hit a tornado DDT that got him two. Sami tried an exploder <laughs> on Bronson Reed which is a very stupid idea for someone like Sami Zayn 
to try and explode a suplex on this man. I don't care how much time in the gym he's been spending with Chad Gable. He hasn't been spending nearly enough to be able to do that. And so that didn't work. Reed responded with a twisting vertical suplex and a senton. Then he went up to the top. He went for the tsunami splash. Sammy moved out of the way. Zayn set up for the haluva kick, but he looks to the aisle way, and what does he see? Gunther is dragging Chad Gable's dead body out onto the stage. I don't know what he did to this man. I don't know if he slipped him something in his drink, in his uh, protein shake. I don't know what he did, but Chad Gable was out, and he was not moving, and so he was laying there like a dead body on the floor. This concerned uh, Sammy, who ended up leaving the ring, and he goes down the aisle way to go check on his buddy Chad, because Gunther had gone to the back, but he suckered him in. So when Sammy went to go check on Gable, Gunther ran back out, and he booted Sammy. He beat this man down for a while, then he posed with his Intercontinental title. He was about to leave, but Sammy started to struggle back to his feet. Now, again, I, I don't know what Gun Gunther did to this man. Maybe he hit him over the head with a wrench. I don't know, because throughout this entire beatdown, Chad Gable did not move a muscle. He was out. He was paralyzed. I, I don't know what he did to him. I would have loved to have known. Because he was he was booting Sammy in the face. Sammy was coming back up to his feet. Not Chad Gable. Once uh, Sammy did make it back to his feet, though, Gunther blasted him with the belt. I assume this ended in a disqualification. They never bothered to announce what the outcome of the match was. They, I, I mean, it was crazy. They never even rang the bell. You would think they would ring the bell. This match is still in progress. Sami Zayn and Bronson Reed is still in progress, as far as anybody knows. Uh, in case you were wondering the importance and the significance of actual wrestling matches on these uh, weekly TV shows, there is none. There is none. We got the same thing in the main event. No contest. No decision. It's a means to an end. Tonight, here, it was a means to an angle to promote Gunther and Sami at WrestleMania. In the main event, it was a means to promote the bloodline stuff. The outcome of the matches, it doesn't matter which kind of makes it a little hard to get invested in these matches when you realize that they don't mean anything. So I hate the fact that they did that twice on the same show, at least spread that shit out. Don't just throw it in our face that these matches don't mean anything. The good thing, though, about it, I guess, is that they didn't do the 50-50 thing, where Reed beats Sammy, and then Sammy comes right back and beats Reed. Now, if Sammy was to win the title from Gunther, I'm not saying yet if he is or isn't, I'm going to save my predictions for Thursday, but if he was to win the Intercontinental title, it would make sense that you, you do what they did here because you didn't pin Bronson Reed. You know, you left things open. He could potentially be Sammy's first challenger now for the Intercontinental title. Backstage, Jay Uso was walking through the hallway, and he runs into... Lil Wayne, who just happens to be sitting on top of one of the equipment cases. He's just hanging out in the back. And Jay goes over to him. He says, if Wheezy ain't busy this weekend, come through WrestleMania. And Lil Wayne says that he'll be there. He's got a brand new single, and he'll be there. So there you go. Lil Wayne is going to be at WrestleMania. You know who else is going to be at WrestleMania? According to PW Insider, what they're reporting, expected to be at WrestleMania this year, Drew Barrymore. See, so Drew McIntyre will not be the only Drew at WrestleMania this year. Apparently, Drew Barrymore will be there. I know you're all very excited. Ivy, not, I think the last movie I saw her in, honestly, was E.T. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember. Actually, I take that back. I'm sorry. Scream. The first Scream. She got killed off in the first 10 minutes, but she was great in the first Scream. After that, I couldn't tell you another movie I saw her in ever since that movie. And when did Scream come out? 96? She'll be there. Ivy Nile and Maxine Dupree against Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. You know, if it was possible to get a negative reaction from the crowd, this was it right here. They wrestled to... I actually felt bad for them. They wrestled to silence. Candice knocked Ivy off the top rope behind the referee's back. 
Indy didn't like that, and she confronted her partner about this. Maxine then drop kicked Indy into Candace, which knocked Candace off the apron. And then Maxine rolled up Indy for the win. So Maxine Dupree picks up a win here in this match. And uh, Candace was very upset about this. Look, I don't have an issue with them pushing these women. I don't have any. Well, we could talk about Maxine and whether she should even be on TV right now. But I don't have an issue with them if they have a heel turn in mind for Candice LeRae. They got to do something with Candice. And, you know, the poison pixie and whatever they were doing with her before sucked. Like, it wasn't working. Nobody cared. So I don't have an issue with them wanting to turn her heel. The problem is that I have with it is that none of these women are on the WrestleMania card. They have nothing to do at WrestleMania this year. And so they've been running these segments, they've been running these angles. This would have been something that was better off being held until after WrestleMania. Doing two-minute matches is not going to get anybody over. I don't care who you are. Men, women, aliens. Doesn't matter. You're not going to get over doing a bunch of meaningless two-minute matches. And there's no backstage vignettes. They're clearly doing a character change with Candice LeRae. They don't do any backstage stuff with her in Indy, right? There's really no promo time. If they're not going to be part of WrestleMania, save it until after WrestleMania and do it the right way. Doing it this way, they're half-assing it. And then people are going to be like, oh, well, she didn't get over. Nobody cares. But yeah, well, I wonder why. Give them a reason to care. Why all of a sudden is she doing the things that she's doing? Why is she cheating all of a sudden? Why is she why is she so underhanded in her matches when for the first year and a half of her time on the main roster, she was the opposite of that? This is going to end up going the same way that angle went with Nikki Cross. Whatever happened with that? Remember Nikki Cross was like catatonic, comatose in the back and always following her around. And what was what was the end result of that angle? Whatever happened to that? Is Nikki Cross even on the roster anymore? You know, they start and stop. You know, Triple H, he's done a lot of positive things. I like a lot of the creative changes that he has made and the leeway and the freedom that people have on promos. That's one of the things I loved about the show last week. You wouldn't have gotten a show like that under Vince McMahon. Right? Triple H has done a lot of good. But there's still stuff like that that just drives me fucking nuts. And I know it's with, you know, minor players on the roster it's not like uh, you know they're they're really positioning these people to be uh, featured in any meaningful way but if you're going to try with them at least try you know put the effort in and they're just not doing that so this is going to end up going the same exact way Jey Uso approached Seth Rollins in the back and he was in the hallway and he called Seth one crazy dude for going into a Bloodline Rules match in the main event with his brother. And he says, look, it's Bloodline Rules. If they try anything, I just want you to know, I got your back just like you had my back last week. And Seth told him he was glad to hear that, and he told Jay, walk with me. And we couldn't hear what they were talking about as they walked off. Yeah, you know, somebody mentioned Dexter Loomis. That, that's another great mystery. <laughs> what the hell happened to Dexter Loomis? Maybe these people were released and I just, like, I'm supposed to know these things. I'm, I'm supposed to know all these things. I don't believe he was released. So where has he been? I didn't hear anything about an injury. I don't believe he's hurt. If he was hurt, he'd already be recovered by now. That's how long he's been gone for. I, I don't know. I don't know what happened to Dexter Lewis. One day he was feuding with The Miz. He was creepily popping out from under the ring. And then we never saw him again. Maybe he's under the ring. Maybe that's where he is. Drew McIntyre. We had a vignette here from the funeral parlor. And he was standing in front of an open casket. He closed the lid. And he walked up to the podium. And he gave a very quick eulogy for CM Punk. He says, look in my eyes. What do you see? CM Punk has no match in Philly. On January 27th, he said the world lost the opportunity to see an out-of-shape has-been main event. And as I say that, Kevin Nash has popped up on screen. Look at that. 
the quad squad. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, the world lost the opportunity on January 27th to see an out-of-shape has-been main event WrestleMania when his brittle, fragile body failed him worse than it did in the UFC. Punk's tricep, like the rest of us, wanted to get as far away from him as possible. Now we're left with a thin-skinned guy who saw Jared Leto as the Joker and wanted to build his entire personality off of him. Seth Cringe Lord Rollins, he said. Seth, you're broken. You already have one foot in the grave, and your pride has convinced you that you can survive the Rock and Roman, and then me. You deserve the beating coming your way because you have begged me for it. You deserve to have the casket closed on your championship reign. At WrestleMania, I will take that broken old workhorse out back and put him down once and for all. Amen. Have I mentioned that Drew McIntyre has been doing the best work of his career and deserves another run with the world championship, which I am, I'm hoping that they give him that. I do, you know, remember the Damian Priest is still waiting in the wings and he's got that money in the bank. And I, I kind of feel like if he doesn't at least attempt to cash in at WrestleMania, then what the hell is he waiting for? But man, if anybody deserved a run, it's this guy. But you've got Punk at ringside doing commentary, and you have to imagine, you know, he's going to factor in in some way. Yeah, he even said in the interview with Ariel today, he goes, I'm doing what they tell me to do. I'm trying to follow the rules, but I feel great. You know, because he asked him physically, do you feel like you could go? And he said, basically, the answer was yes, but he's got to just adhere to what the doctors tell him to do. So I don't know how much physicality he can actually... Uh, be cleared to do at WrestleMania, but if he's going to be a ringside, you know, even if it's a distraction or you know, something like that, you have to imagine he's going to factor into the match in some way. So poor Drew may end up getting screwed over at WrestleMania, but boy, uh, this guy, this guy here, you know, a lot of people talk about the bloodline, myself included, and how this WrestleMania has just been built around that, and and I'm excited to see how that plays out. But I am more interested in seeing Drew McIntyre challenge for the world title than I would have ever expected to be, considering the fact that this is a match we've already seen twice before. And he didn't win the title then. The idea of running it back for what I believe is a third time, if you would have told me that two or three months ago, I would have said, oh, God, really? Like, we're doing this again? And yet we're less than a week away, and it's one of the matches I'm looking forward to the most. Because they have done a very good job. And he has done a very good job of getting me invested. And I have come around on the guy in a big way. I think he's been fantastic heading into WrestleMania. I think he deserves his flowers for that. Amen. We had Ricochet. You know, if ever there was a time for me to do the heavenly... Uh... Can I get an amen for Drew McIntyre? There you go. Just seemed like an appropriate time for that. Hallelujah. Drew McIntyre is finally interesting. Ricochet against Ivar, who was not medically cleared last week to wrestle Andrade, but he was good to go this week. So whatever the issue was, obviously he is 100%. Ricochet drop kicked him, and Ivar tumbled to the floor. Ricochet went for a dive from the ring that Ivar was able to avoid. And then Ricochet set up for an Asai moonsault, but Ivar broke that up, and that took us into the commercial break. Ivar cut off Ricochet with a kick, and then powerbombed him for an ear fall. And the big guy went for a move in the corner. Ricochet, though, avoided it, and he hit Ivar with a knee strike. He went for a springboard crossbody block. Ivar caught him, though, and then slammed him. Ivar hit a springboard crossbody block for an ear fall. And then he went up top. And he attempted his doom salt. Ricochet, though, was able to avoid it. Ivar stood up. He charged at Ricochet. Ricochet caught this man. He caught Ivar. And he executed a fallaway slam. Now, if Ricochet, who's even smaller than Sammy, if Ricochet can do that to Ivar, then Sammy should be able to pick up Bronson Reed for an exploder suplex. So. I'm just saying, if Ricochet can do that, there ain't no reason that Sammy can't pick up Bronson Reed. 
So Ricochet followed that with a 630 splash, and he scored the pin. Uh, good match. And uh, Ricochet has had a string of these recently. He's had a string of very good matches. That match last week that he had with J.D. McDonough was excellent. They've been pushing Ricochet noticeably, more so in recent weeks than they have in a very long time. And I can't help it. You know, I, I can't help but be skeptical about these things. And the first thought that crosses my mind is, who's killing this man after WrestleMania? Who are they calling up? Who are they bringing into Raw? Who are they going to program with Ricochet who can beat Ricochet to get them over? Because that must be why they're pushing Ricochet all of a sudden. It's not like we haven't seen them push Ricochet and then not push him and then push him a little bit and then not push him. We, we've been through this before. And I like Ricochet, and it's cool that he's getting to push, but I just can't help but think that this is only happening because they're getting ready to call up somebody new, maybe from NXT. They're going to put them with Ricochet, and they want him to rack up a few wins. You know, give him a little bit of credibility before they put him in there with the person they're actually going to push. Can't shake this feeling. Carmelo Hayes. Somebody mentions Carmelo Hayes. You know what? You may be onto something. I, I, I expect him to be up on the main roster next week. Stand and Deliver, I think, is his swan song with NXT. As soon as next Monday, depending on what brand he's on, next Monday or next Friday. And I mean, fucking Nick Aldis has been signing everybody. He got Braun Breaker. He got Jade Cargill. The Rock is mostly on SmackDown. He was on Raw tonight. Actually, he's been on Raw for two weeks now, but he's been a SmackDown guy for most of this run. You got to give Adam Pierce has got to be bringing some people in here. Carmelo Hayes. You could bring Carmelo Hayes to Raw, put him with Ricochet. I think, see, I think you're right. See, I knew I was right. I knew, I knew it. It makes total sense. Back in the uh, Judgment Day clubhouse, Damian Priest was wondering why Ricochet has not been handled already. Why is he still breathing? Why is he still running around and winning matches? JD McDonough said that he would handle Ricochet in the Andre Battle Royal on SmackDown, right? Show of hands, how many of you believe that J.D. McDonough is going to win the Battle Royal on Friday night? Show of hands, how many of you give a shit who wins the Battle Royal on Friday night? That's what I thought. So he said he would handle Ricochet himself, since they're both in the Battle Royal. Dominic says that uh, he's sure that J.D. is going to handle Ricochet, but, in case he doesn't, he's got just the guy for the job, and at that moment, Andrade walks in. And Dominic says, if Andrade takes care of their Ricochet situation, they will make him a full-fledged member of the crew. And Andrade agreed. And Rhea said that uh, Becky is on her way to the ring. I'm going to go say hello. And off she went. And so we went to yet another commercial break. JD has a chance. JD has no chance. <laughs> it's not April Fool's Day anymore. It's April 2nd. You can cut the shit. JD has no chance. After a commercial, Becky Lynch was out to the ring and immediately called out Rhea Ripley until Adam Pierce came out and told her, no. No, 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 no. We're not doing this tonight. You can't jeopardize one of the biggest matches on the biggest WrestleMania of all time. Respectfully, he is asking her to leave the ring. Unfortunately for Adam Pierce, uh, he forgot to tell the sound guy because they played Rhea Ripley's music. And so now out comes Rhea. And Pierce stops her and, sa and basically begs her and says, don't do this. Save it for WrestleMania. So she thought about it. And she throws her belt at Pierce to distract him. And then she proceeds to make a beeline for the ring. She beats up all of the security geeks along the way. She got in the ring. The two women started going at it. Security dragged Rhea out of the ring. Becky went to the top rope. She dove out onto everybody, wiped them all out. The brawl briefly resumed until they were separated again. And that was it. A very abrupt ending to a segment that they had promoted for the entire show. I mean, they, they, they were promoting it like, I'm going to go out to the ring later and we're going to see what happens. And we ended up here with a whole lot of nothing. This didn't even last a full four, four minutes, five minutes. I thought this was very lackluster. Immediately, they went to the back, and Damage Control from SmackDown was there. 
WrestleMania season, I guess. So pretty much there's no rules as far as these brands go. So it was Io Sky, Asuka, Kairi Sane, and Dakota Kai. Dakota said that Bailey, or she was addressing Bailey, she said damage control is the future. And Michael Cole hyped up damage control coming up in a six-woman tag after the break. And then it was right back to another commercial. I mean, it was it was commercial hell in these last two hours. This is why I hate the commercial free first hour. I mean, it's just this always happens. I mean, they come back from break, nothing happens. They'll they'll have a video package, they'll have a backstage segment, somebody will be walking to the ring. And it'll be right back to another commercial. And this was constant through these last two hours. But then they teased an announcement that is coming tomorrow. There is an announcement coming to announce the city and venue for the next Clash at the Castle show. Now, Clash at the Castle is going to be taking place on Saturday, June 15th. The logo for the first one, which is not the one that you see on your screen here, but the logo for the first show included a Welsh dragon. You'll notice here, as I have been educated, in this logo here in this image on your screen, that is the Scottish Royal Lion. So it appears that Clash at the Castle is coming to Scotland. Where in Scotland? We will find out tomorrow. All I can think is like, man, if if CM Punk could get cleared by June. Imagine CM Punk and Drew McIntyre in Scotland. See, that'd be that'd be a good place to do that match. Uh, Punk would not be the babyface there necessarily, but imagine the reaction to that match if they could save it for Scotland. There is the chance that Punk could be cleared by then. I mean, according to what he said earlier, he's way ahead of schedule. He feels good. June is not that far away. It's eh, touch and go, but it's possible. Might not be likely, but it's possible. So Becky and Rhea, they cut to the back, and Becky and Rhea continue their brawl. Adam Pierce and a bunch of geeks, they're there trying to, they're having a hell of a time trying to pull these two women apart. And finally, they uh, move on to the next match, which is damage control against Tegan Knox, Zoe Stark, and Shayna Baszler. They went to a break in the middle of the match. After the break, Zoe hit Asuka with a German suplex and hit Kyrie with a missile dropkick. Tegan tagged in, hit a cannonball. Asuka broke up the cover. Everybody traded moves until Dakota hit Tegan with a running corner kick. Asuka held Tegan in place for Kyrie to hit the assisted insane elbow to pick up the win. You know, they actually gave these women some time. Uh, this went almost 10 minutes, but it ran through a break. So basically, it cut the match in half. And like the women's tag team match earlier, the crowd was very quiet for this. They did not care. Kathy Kelly caught up with Seth Rollins backstage as he was making his way to the ring, and she was asking him, why did you take on this match with Solo Sokoa? And Rollins said he only has one gear. It's pedal to the metal. Rollins said he always has a plan B. And then after he walked away from Kathy, he's walking along and he runs into Drew McIntyre, who was sitting on top of a production case, just happens to be sitting there, and he's smirking at Seth. And Rollins just tells him, I'm not dead yet, and he goes to walk off and McIntyre says, yet. He says, you're not dead yet. So Rollins makes his way through Gorilla into the arena, our main event. Of this show, Seth Rollins one on one with Solo Sokoa under bloodline rules, which means anything goes. So basically, every single WWE hardcore match that you see pretty much every other week. Rollins hits Sokoa with a dive right off the bat. He ran Solo into the ring steps. The fans did not waste any time. We had chance of table. We didn't have chance for Seth. We had chance of table. That's what they wanted to see. Solo battled back. He slammed Rollins headfirst on top of the announce desk and then dumped him into the timekeeper's area. Rollins, though, picks up four chairs, one at a time, and he just launches them one by one at Solo's head. So we don't have chair shots to the head in this company when you hold the chair, but if you throw the chair, that's okay. So four of them, he got his, got his hands up, 
But you had Pat McAfee on commentary go, he hit him in the head with a chair. He's probably got somebody in the back going, oh my God. So then Rollins set up a chair. He DDT'd Solo onto the seat. Rollins pulled a table out from underneath the ring. Everybody lost their shit. Set it up inside the ring. Solo battled back and hit a Samoan drop that put Rollins through the table. That's the spot that I mentioned before where it looked like he smacked the back of his head pretty hard. And that took us into the final commercial break. So uh, Solo charged Rollins on the floor coming out of the break. Rollins moved. Solo ran into the ring steps. Back inside, Rollins avoided another Samoan drop uh, from the ropes. And he countered that into a powerbomb. He had him up in a powerbomb position coming out of the sunset. And then he put Solo through the table. Rollins followed that up with a stomp. Solo was well on his way to an 0-35 record when Jimmy Uso came out to save the day, because it is bloodline rules. But then here comes Jay Uso, and Jimmy and Jay, they fight to the back. Now the camera lingers on the stage, so you knew somebody was coming back out, and seconds later we see Jay Uso, he gets launched. We don't see by who. But then The Rock walks out. and. He threw Jay into the LED screen. Then he turned to turn his attention to Seth Rollins. Seth was all alone on the mat in the ring by himself. And here comes The Rock. Rock gets in the ring. He looks down at Seth. And he's talking shit. Seth looks up at The Rock. And suddenly he begins to smirk. This was his plan B. They play Cody's music. To the surprise of no one. Here comes Cody Rhodes, believe it or not, not in a suit. I thought he came out of the womb that way, but apparently he does wear other clothes. So he comes out in his street clothes. He runs to the ring, and he puts a beating on the rock. Been waiting for this, right? This was absolutely something that had to happen coming out of that angle last week. He had to avenge the beatdown that the rock gave him. And this was his moment. He gets into the ring. He's throwing shots at The Rock. The Rock is bumping around as best he can. He's bumping around. And he's in his fucking dress shoes. So it's like, it's still, it's weird, you know, when you're not in your boots and you're not in your gear. Like last week, they were out in the rain. And he was wearing probably Gucci loafers in the rain. So I could kind of understand The Rock not wanting to get too physically active or else he might slip and fall. But he was bumping around here for Cody. And Cody and Seth go outside. They clear off the announce desk. And they bounce the rock off the table a few times. The rock bounces up onto the top of it. So then Cody gets up on top of the desk. And he picks up the rock. And he's setting up for a rock bottom through the table. Here comes Roman Reigns. And he attacks Cody uh, from behind, hits him in the leg. So now we know one of the spots we're probably getting at WrestleMania is a rock bot whether rock is giving or taking i don't know but uh yeah i, I don't know if, who knows but that's probably a spot we could expect on wrestlemania one of the two nights so roman ran cody into the ring post the fans chanted for cm punk why because why not i guess it made sense in their minds rock threw seth into the ring roman nailed him with the superman punch then Rock threw Cody into the ring, and Roman speared the hell out of him. I thought Cody sold this great. He took it like a champ. Rock got back in the ring. The cousins embraced. And then Rock used a red, white, and blue Nightmare logo weight belt. And he proceeded to whip the dog shit out of Cody. And he whipped the dog shit out of Seth. He handed the belt to Roman, who did the same thing. The whipping continued with Rock whipping Cody. He was whipping that boy like a government mule. Rock and Roman, they posed with, and I wish I had grabbed the screenshot of it, but one of the, one of the last shots they showed uh, was Rock and Roman standing in the ring together, united, and behind them, like just perfectly behind them, centered in the crowd is someone holding up a sign that says, Tuna Meltzer, right behind them. And that is how they went off the air. You had Roman talking smack to Seth, who was laying on the ground. Rock was standing there in the ring, the final boss. Crowd booing as the baby faces are laying there wounded, going into their tag team match on Saturday night. 
it was a classic old school heel go home beat down right before the big pay-per-view right before the big show classic pro wrestling 101 got a lot of heat we got to see the rocket physical this is the most physical he has been up to this point since he came back and again didn't look like he hurt himself or tore anything which is good uh, because the last time he had a proper match he tore almost every muscle in his body you know, they mentioned on commentary, this is going to be The Rock's first match in eight years. I don't count that. That was six seconds. The last real match this man had was in 2013. It's a long time ago. Him in a tag team match, though, is for the better. And on Saturday, we'll get to see what 51, was he 51? 51 year old Rock, who hasn't wrestled proper, properly in 11 years, looks like. But to his credit, he was bumping around here and. He looked fine. Uh, Cody got a little bit of revenge on The Rock, but still, for the second week in a row, he got left lane. He got whipped, and he got left lane. And he may be the one taking the losing fall, looking up at the lights on Saturday night, but I don't see how you can watch every show and every single segment and every angle they have shot, including tonight, and not expect any other conclusion on Sunday but the Cody Rhodes celebration the red white and blue pyro it's like the rocky story in philadelphia and him holding that title above his head right mama Rhodes in the front row everything is just perfectly positioned for him to walk away with the title the opposite of what they did at the end of last year's show and i truly believe that if they go with any other outcome here to that main event on sunday not that cody is not going to be a star uh but Cody Rhodes, as we know him, you know, as the one they are clearly trying to position as the top babyface in the company, and who really is the top babyface in the company right now, I don't see how he can be the top babyface for anything. I really don't. He'll still be well-liked. He'll still be pushed. But whatever credibility he has, whatever, I mean, it's just, you can't watch what they have done and expect any other outcome. And I know there are still people who think that Roman is going to retain. And I just can't, I can't fathom it. With how they have built this up, I just cannot fathom them pulling the same bullshit that they pulled at the end of WrestleMania last year. We'll find out this weekend. But hey, Roman will get to break one Hogan record this weekend, so we don't have to worry about the other one. Roman is actually working two matches in one weekend. When was the last time that happened? It's been a while. It's a good Raw overall. Great sell there for the final final sell there for the big main event. Uh, did what they had to do with that angle. On the whole, not as great of a show as last week. But for a go-home show, I think they did what they had to do. There was definitely more filler on the show this week than there was last week. Uh, but I thought it was a good effort overall. How would you grade Raw from Brooklyn tonight? 1,500 plus votes in so far. 73% thumbs up. 18% thumbs in the middle, 8.5% have voted for thumbs down and did not like today's show or last night's show. Since it is officially 1 o'clock in the morning, it is no longer April 1st. At Solomonster on Twitter is the place where you can go to vote. Now let's get to your super chats here. After a... Final Raw. One final Raw here before WrestleMania. We're almost there. We got some big reviews coming up as well on the Saturday night and Sunday night. Tends to be the bigger of the uh, of the entire year. So hopefully you will be back here with me live for both nights. We'll cover WrestleMania night one and night two. But right now, let's uh, dive into these. I thank you, by the way, everybody who did donate here and dropped a super chat. I do appreciate it. We are kicking off the month of April here. So I'm hoping to have an even bigger April than the one we had last year. That would be nice. We could have a uh, record-setting April. That's always what I'm looking for here. All right, let's start off with some early ones that are not in the list. Kind of the pre-chats, the pre-super chats. Uh, hey, Crypto and Poker, thank you for the two bucks. Crypto and Poker had one question. Wanted to know, do I see ICP, the Insane Clown Posse, ever making the WWE... Hall of Fame. I do not. Groovy Goose 
with a 499. Solemn Monster with Mania Weekend around the corner. The chat has decided to prep you for how busy you will be by chasing a chicken. I have no idea what you're talking about. It's impossible. Can't be done. Crypto and Poker, Cody is now a tool and he needs to lose at WrestleMania. Well, hopefully you are not sitting in the creative meeting going into WrestleMania this week. <laughs> I certainly hope that is not the case. Oh, I see. I see, I see Issa's comment. Yeah, no, Issa, Issa's been saying this for weeks. Issa has been saying that Roman is going to retain for weeks. And I offered to buy her a box of Kleenex because she's going to be in tears at the end of that main event on Sunday. She didn't take me up on my offer. I tried. I'll give you the box that I have right here. You want to buy you? You want a box? I got a, I got a box right here. I got tissues in this box right here. So here you go. Right there. This is for you. All right, with my Super Mario Brothers 3, I will give this to you. Actually, I won't. But uh, I think that the tears will be flowing. It will not be flowing from me either way, because I'm going to have a big night no matter what. So <laughs> I'll be just fine. I just think it would be creatively fucking dumb if that happens. But uh, yes. We'll all be a support group for Issa and all the other, uh, all the other Roman tribalists when he loses on Sunday. Base Beer says Rocky borrowed that vest from Tyler Breeze. Now you got it wrong, actually. Tyler Breeze borrowed it from The Rock. He's had that in his closet now for 24 years. <laughs> He's had it in there for a long time. Uh, Daddy Ball says bring back the mobile ring cards from WrestleMania 6. I agree. They had, well, they had them at WrestleMania 3, and then they brought them back for WrestleMania 6. Detective Tyler says, That Paris ad during the last ad break before the top of the second hour confused me <laughs> to high heaven. I thought my show... <laughs> I thought my show switched languages. Yes, I, I did not mention that, but there was a commercial at one point. Because the Paris, the Paris games are coming to, I guess, USA Network. So they had a commercial where they were showing a Judgment Day segment in the back where they were confronting, I think, Adam Pierce and Nick all this. And I thought it was part of the show. But it was all in French. I'm like, I didn't know Damien Priest knew French. And then they cut to the emblem and it was like, it was an ad for the Paris uh, games. But yeah, it, it confused the hell out of me too. I, I was like, wait a minute, did I switch to the wrong feed? Like I thought something, something happened here. Orioles Peak. Thank you for the five bucks, Orioles Peak. Roman, by the way, by the way, I don't even know if they played today. I, I've already, the season already started. I've already given up on, on the Mets. But I know up until yesterday, the Mets the Mets had a reverse Undertaker streak going, where to open the season, they they had lost all their mat, all their, their matches. They had, lost, <laughs> they had lost all their games. So they basically have like an Oscar WrestleMania streak going so far. So yeah. Better to be an Orioles fan than a Mets fan. Roman's going out sad, he says. I don't know why he or his fans think that he can keep this up for another year. Also, outside of the Cody matches, the rest of the card sucks. And he says, Rock can't save Triple H every time. He has to be better. So Orioles Peak is not a fan of the WrestleMania build. Dry Chicken says... <laughs> As soon as I get that, the very next one, Dry Chicken says, The Rock makes pro wrestling cool again. Hashtag facts. Well, apparently the two of you disagree. Ace of Masta. What a lucky coincidence for this corporate management punk interview to happen on the same day in which more shit comes out about Vince. Yeah, and, here, and every week that goes by... You know, with the podcast, I think to myself, well, at least I won't have to talk about him anymore. And then I uh, end up speaking too soon. The real CSO2. Uh, I was stunned, he says, to find out that AEW did not even pay for Punk's surgery for his torn triceps, which he injured on their watch, might I add. Uh, 
Uh, that was one of the revelations from the interview today, uh, which I will be getting into, but not tonight. Philly Dry Chicken says, Sweet Dakota Kai, boom, 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 good times never seem so good. Chant for Dakota Kai. Troy King, Chad and Sammy versus Gunther gives me Rocky Four vibes. You are not the only one. The Real CS says, hearing Punk's interview on the MMA Hour uh, and about TK's poor leadership puts into perspective that Punk was not the only one to blame for everything. Well, if you were to listen to people who actually know what they're talking about, like myself, uh, I don't know that anybody ever said that he was the only one responsible for everything. I mean, maybe there were. Maybe there were people out there saying that. Uh, I certainly wasn't one of them. God knows I ranted on him, and I ranted on Tony, and I ranted on every fucking person involved in that situation, going back to September of 2022. There are no innocent victims and blameless people in this scenario. Prince Vegeta says, I can't wait for a certain champion to break my quote-unquote record in September, brother. Yeah. Jerome Eugenio. What's going on, Eugene? Eugenio, Eugene. What the hell am I even saying? Jerome, I haven't heard from you in a while. I won't be watching WrestleMania, but I will be tuning in for your review. That's right. That's right. I got you covered. You should watch WrestleMania, though. I think it's going to be a good show. Look, last year's WrestleMania I thought was excellent. Uh, night one of WrestleMania last year was a lot better than night two. But somebody asked me a question on the most recent podcast uh, yesterday. They wanted me to do the Mount Rushmore of WrestleManias. I put WrestleMania 39 on my Mount Rushmore of WrestleManias. I think taken together, top to bottom, you put both nights together, and I, I thought it was an excellent WrestleMania, so... I have high expectations for the show this year. Uh, Nick Grosso, did you see the Bray Wyatt documentary? If so, what did you think? And do you think Bo Dallas will come back as Uncle Howdy or some other character? Uh, I am only 30 minutes uh, into the documentary, so I have not finished it yet. Um, there was just a lot going on today, unfortunately. Fortunately and unfortunately, just a lot going on. So I only got 30 minutes into it. I know it's two hours long. So far, it's it's, it's already very emotional. But we haven't even really gotten into the emotional stuff yet. But like when they first started talking about Luke Harper and they had comments from him talking about Bray and this was at the beginning of the Wyatt family. It's just, it just hits, it hits you. You know, like, wow, the, how are these two people not here? Like, how does that happen? It's a weird, it's a weird thing because there have been a lot of premature wrestling deaths over the years. And I'm hopeful that in the years to come, there won't be nearly as many of them because there's a lot of shit that was going on 20, 30, 40 years ago that people aren't doing as much of now. But it just got to a point where you would hear about a lot of these wrestlers that were, um, that were young passing away in their 30s and their 40s, and, you know, sadly, you just come to expect it. It's like, oh, okay. Another drug death. You know, that's kind of what happens. In this case, you had two people. Uh, Harper was, I think, 40, right? John Huber, John Huber was 40. Bray was a little younger than that. Um, both in the prime of their life, both in the prime of their career, and in both cases had nothing to do with that you know it had nothing to do with them doing drugs it had nothing to do with them drinking themselves to death it had nothing to do with them doing anything nefarious or illegal or anything like that it's just you know the kind of the luck that befell them um and they both happened to be part of the same faction in the same company it's just it's just weird you know it's just weird like i can't imagine how somebody like eric rowan feels or stroman you know, being a part of that family, being a part of that crew, and two of their brothers are just gone, and you, you know, you ask why, like, why are they not here now? And there's really no good reason for it. And it's it's tough, you know, it's a tough thing to try to reconcile, you know, in your brain. It just doesn't make sense. 
but yeah, once I once I finish watching it, uh, it may not be until Sunday, but once I finish um, watching it, as far as a review, it may not be until Sunday, but I will talk about it once I watch the entire thing. This journey called life. I loved the CM Punk interview today. Says uh, respect to him. Chris Auditor. Now we're catching up here with the, with the screen. Chris Auditor with the five bucks says, after watching the way Rock took those bumps tonight, I am convinced that Rock can take a stone cold stunner like the old days. Oh, he could take a stunner. He better be taking a stunner on Sunday. He better be. Uh, Booba says, I have this feeling, a gut feeling, that Roman will be the baby face when Rock and Roman face off. Am I crazy, Mr. Solomon? No. I think that the I think that the goal of this should be, at the end of all of it, to get Roman over as a huge babyface. I mean, that's kind of what I figured the end result of the bloodline was gonna be when the bloodline thing ran its course, that after being a heel for so long, that Roman would end up being what Vince McMahon always wanted him to be, which is the accepted like top mega baby face in the company. I still feel that way. Uh, we have got C. Garcia. Love your show, Solo Monster. Why is it called Go Home Show? Uh, it's just a term that was coined many years ago. Um, I, I always just assumed it was a sports reference, like, you know, go home, like in a baseball game. You're going into a pay-per-view. It's like, all right, these are the go-home shows. This is this is the final stretch. This is it. This is our last chance to sell the show. That's just kind of what I figured. The Carlosis. Look in my eyes. What do you see? CM Punk has no match in Philly. God mode Drew McIntyre. Surely this man wins at WrestleMania. No way creative bottles this. Well, I mean, he may win at WrestleMania. That doesn't mean he's going to leave with the title. Marcus Creed. After the last two weeks, it'd be the worst decision since Austin turning heel if Cody does not win that damn belt. Agreed. It would be booking malpractice. Marcus, thank you for the 499. Be calm, see clearly. What the fuck? Stop blaming other people for Punk's action. Who's that directed to? McIntyre? I don't know. Uh, Kells says nothing. Just dropping a dono. Hey, Kells, thank you. Austin Blancet. Steve Austin should be the referee in the tag team match. No, he should. He doesn't need to be the tag team. He doesn't need to be the tag team match referee. He doesn't need to be the, the referee for any match. If he's going to be on the show, you, again, it's like I can visualize it in my head. If he is going to be on the show, maybe he's not, but if he's going to be on the show, and I, him and Cena, I have a feeling they're both going to be there. There's a very, very specific situation where Cody is being outnumbered. He's being beaten down again. It's just not a fair fight. The rock is full of himself. And then the glass shatters. And because you want that reaction. I'm going out there to be the referee. Like, who gives a shit? We don't need Austin. We had Austin as a referee at WrestleMania 23. Like, he's already done that before. That's not how you use Steve Austin in this situation. The very particular way that you use him, if he's going to be there, that is not the way to do it. MacTub, Punk or Brian, bigger star. Uh, Punk. I mean, I don't even think it's close. Uh, and favorite WWE wrestler right now? I'll tell you what, Drew McIntyre has made a pretty good case for it. I think I go with him. I go with Drew McIntyre. I've been consistently enjoying his work now for, I would say, what has it been? Probably five months, four or five months now. Stephen Fees with the seven bucks. Stephen, thank you. Says, decent raw when you cut out the middle. More excited for the in-studio than I am for Mania. 
safe travels into town and best of luck this week. Thank you, Steven. I appreciate that very much. Bayo's 10, biggest backfire, letting Cody go or, re or re-signing CM Punk? Biggest backfire, letting Cody go. I don't know what that means. Resigning? <laughs> Do you mean letting Punk go? Are we talking AEW here? Like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I understand the question. I I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume he means letting Cody go or letting Punk go. Uh, well, Punk had to go. So... Tony, Tony made the, the decision that he had to make in that circumstance. Uh, letting Cody go, you look at the success that he's had in WWE, you look at the importance of him to AEW. Frankly, you know, you look at some of the situations that have developed and some of the problems and the drama in AEW, and I do wonder if a lot of that could have been avoided had Cody stayed, if we would have seen a lot less of the bullshit that we have seen. So I would not underestimate the importance, the significance of letting Cody go and the impact that that had, the negative impact that that had on AEW to let him walk away. We still don't know his exact reasons for walking away. Though. That's the thing. You know, it, may, it may ultimately not have even been Tony Khan's decision if, if he had a personal reason for having, to, which he has said it was a personal reason he had for leaving. Uh, he's never actually come out and said what that reason is. The Carlosa says, I can already hear Pat McAfee screaming, throw in the damn towel at Chad while Gunther is suplexing Sammy to death. Uh, the real Blair Dior. If Swerve was to come back to WWE, do you think he would have a better run? Under Triple H? Of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. The success that he's had so far in AEW? And now being under a completely different regime in WWE? I mean, you're setting the bar very low here because you say a better run. He didn't have a run the second, the, the first time. You're talking about the main roster. He didn't have a run. He had a match, and then he got fired. So, like, we, we can't even really compare it to anything. It would be literally impossible for him to have a worse run than the last one that he had on the main roster in WWE. Like, it's just not possible. Uh, Retro KOH, are you telling me that you wouldn't be hyped if a fucking Martian appeared for a two-minute match out of nowhere? I would be beyond hyped. Aliens, bro. No, I really wouldn't. I would want that to be longer than two minutes. But then, you know, I would look at the alien and I would just say, man, this guy's too green. Uh, Alex. Well, first, we have Pessimistic Hype. Just became a subscriber to the channel. Pessimistic Hype. Retro KOH, thank you. Uh, Alex says, Brother Solo, what should WWE do to utilize those two-hour WrestleMania kickoff shows more effectively? Uh, I would first cut them down to an hour because they don't need to be two hours. So that's number one. Number two, uh, I would come up with one match per kickoff show. And the rest of it I would use to hype up the key matches on the card. So you can air some video packages and you can have your analysts at the desk, you know, running down things and giving their predictions. Two hours is too much. It doesn't have to be two hours. You know, especially if it's two hours without matches. Azen. On the topic of women, it's weird how much Zoe Stark has been cooled off after pairing her with Trish. I think she even has a win over both Becky and Trish. Yeah, I mean, you look back on it and you would hope that coming out of that, it would have helped elevate her. And it really didn't. And it, I, I think there was the chance but they just have not done anything with her. I mean, they, they've paired her up with, with uh, Shayna. You know, 
because they feel like they need teams because they have women's tag team titles that they barely do anything with. In the other respect, though, she wasn't getting over. But I feel like that's on them, you know, put her in a position where she can get over. And once things, you know, split with her and Trish, it just felt like they didn't do anything with her. So can you really say they did anything with her as a single and it just didn't work? Like, what what did they do in the aftermath of the Trish angle? I, I feel like they didn't, you know, they didn't really do anything. Uh, BCOM, see clearly. Solo, talk about Bobo Brazil for my uncle's sake. Bobo Brazil, he's in the Hall of Fame. I don't remember what year he went. I think he went in in 96. I think he's a 1996 Hall of Famer. That's about all I could tell you about Bobo Brazil off the top of my head here at 1 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday morning. So, I'm sorry. I wish I had more for you. I can't give you a list of the top five Bobo Brazil matches, but I'm sure that he had some good ones. Chris Mikesell. Thank you for the $4.99. Very kind of you. Very kind of all of you. <clears throat> what is your favorite Rocky movie? Also, which song do you like better? Eye of the Tiger or Hearts on Fire? This WrestleMania reminds me of Rocky 2. So now we've had comparisons to Rocky 2, II, Rocky 3, and Rocky 4. I love how nobody mentions Rocky V. We can forget that that ever happened. My favorite Rocky movie is Rocky IV. Uh, as far as which song I like better, man, Eye of the Tiger is great. Eye of the Tiger was Hulk Hogan's first song in WWE. Hearts on Fire, though, is a great song, too. I'm going to go Eye of the Tiger, though. I think Eye of the Tiger edges it out. Evan Watson with the 999 Super Chat. Great time tonight at Raw. Rock was awesome. Still want Cody to win, but I'm hearing more about the Hogan record. Do you see Lesnar and Gunther at WrestleMania 41 in, if it's in Minneapolis? I am an 11 year fan, so. Wow, 11 years. So uh, that takes us back to what? 2013 that you've been listening to the podcast for? I remember doing a WrestleMania roundtable here in Brooklyn, as a matter of fact, uh, ahead of WrestleMania 29. So that's a long time. Uh, yeah, do I see Lesnar and Gunther at WrestleMania 41? I honestly, you know, if they bring WrestleMania to Minneapolis next year, uh, I'm pretty sure Brock Lesnar will, will end up being on the show. I just feel like at some point they're going to bring him back. And if they're going to do Mania in Minneapolis, even though he doesn't live there, you know, anymore, uh, that he would be featured into that show in some way. Would it be him and, and Gunther? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Gunther could be the world heavyweight champion by that point. I mean, it's impossible to know what position he'll be in. But there's still marquee value in doing the match. You know, I still think there are people out there who would love to see the match. I know that was Gunther's dream match. He was hoping to get that match. <clears throat> uh, Arabian Knight says, we need a sound off extra for the punk stuff. Well, we'll see. We'll see. There's just so much going on, man. Oh, boy. I'm going to try to fit in as much as I can. I make no promises, but it's a possibility. Alex... Would you say that AEW's downfall, their downfall, uh, began as soon as Cody's departure? And how has Tony Khan fumbled the departures of these massive names like Cody, Punk, and Jade Cargill? Well, Jade, I think Jade just kind of saw the writing on the wall and said, look, if I want to be a bigger star, there's going to be more opportunities for me if I go here. And I think that was very apparent by the fact that Tony Khan asked her, what do you want, like money-wise? And she spit a figure out. And Tony claims he said, okay, he agreed to it, and she still left anyway. So it wasn't just about money. If it was purely a financial thing, she would have taken the money. There was something more that she wanted. I think she saw WWE, and she saw, 
opportunities beyond the wrestling world that they could offer. This woman, I mean, she's, she looks like a, like a goddess. I mean, she's like a megastar just by looking at her. You don't think WWE is not going to take Jade Cargill and turn her into a massive star? You don't think this woman is not one day going to end up probably doing movies and all kinds of different things outside of wrestling? Of course. And she felt like, I think she felt like, she can have a better go of it if she left and went there. And I think she's right. Uh, as far as Punk thing, we've talked about why that happened. Cody, I, I think Cody is... Cody Cody was definitely a blow to that company. You know, losing him, it was more than just losing a big name in the ring. You know, they lost an EVP. They lost, I feel like, an anchor that they had behind the scenes. So that was a big blow to them. Uh, Dill Pill with the $5 Super Chat. I was there tonight. Opener and closer were amazing. I loved the show. Crowd was filled with rock fans who don't know the current product. I believe you. I just mentioned this on the podcast yesterday. I got a buddy of mine who is a wrestling fan, casual wrestling fan now, because he doesn't watch it as much. But he specifically has been tuning in for rock, and he says he's been getting messages from his coworkers. Like, they're just texting him because they know he's, like, the wrestling guy. And they're asking him all kinds of questions about Rock. Oh, did you see SmackDown? Did you see what The Rock did? You know? So I, I'm sure there's a lot of that going on. You know, you have lapsed fans and people who hear that The Rock is back and now he's a bad guy again. And they, they want to tune in. You know? That was their childhood. They want to see Rock do it. They want to see him go out there and be like The Rock of old. You know? And you wonder, when Rock goes away... Do those people go with him? Probably. M. Mills, thank you for the $10 super chat, M. Mills. I hope you are having a very good night. Thank you very much. Oh, we have our we have our buddy Chris Faplander is back with the $1.99. I need... What? I don't know what that is. I can't help you, though. I, I can't help you. I wish I could, but Chris, Chris, thank you very much. We have got Jarrett Rodriguez with the 499 Super Chat. Who would you say is the best wrestler from New York City? Also, how would you, well, it's got to be the Brooklyn Brawler. Come on. How can I say anything other than the Brooklyn Brawler? Also, how would you rank the boroughs worst to best? Manhattan is clearly number one. Harlem all day. Manhattan number one. Let me tell you something. I worked in Manhattan, had a commute in and out of Manhattan for 15 years of my life. Fuck Manhattan. I worked, for Man I worked in Manhattan. I went into Manhattan Monday through Friday, pretty much. Every week of my life for 15 years. I could count probably on one hand. The number of times I have been to Manhattan since the pandemic. And I started working from home. I got my fill. I'm good. Brooklyn, man. Come on, Brooklyn. Brooklyn's got to be number one. Queens. Maybe I'd go Manhattan number, number three. Maybe. Maybe number two. Uh, Staten Island is at the very bottom. I'm sorry to all the Staten Islanders out there. I'm sorry, Chris Statlander. Chris Staten Islander, right? She is, is, isn't she from Staten Island? Or am I thinking of someone else? I'm thinking of someone else. I'm thinking... <laughs> oh no, it's Cody Rhodes! Hit the deck, everybody. It's the ABK bomb. Oh boy. This is what you're going to be hearing on night two. That's what you're going to be hearing on WrestleMania Sunday at the end of the night. Don't tell Issa. She'll get very upset. It's ABK. Always be killing it. Always be killing it is ABK. Wow. From out of nowhere. You never know when it's going to come. You don't know. But there it is. ABK with a huge super chat that I will get to in a, in a few moments here. I don't want to spoil it. We'll get to we'll get to him in a second. But ABK, thank you, brother. 
I hope to see you this weekend for WrestleMania as well. But uh, anyway, who was I thinking of? Staten Island. Uh, which wrestler is from... Is um, Gosh, yeah, no, Chris Statlander is Long Island. I'm confusing her with somebody else. Is it Carmella? Am I thinking, maybe I'm thinking of Carmella. Retro KOH, I got you covered on the Tuna Melter side. I posted it in the Facebook group. Well, that's awesome. But I wish I had it here on the stream. I didn't think to grab it before I came online. ABK, my ears, by the way, are still ringing. I got tinnitus in my ears from the ABK bomb that keeps going off. Now I'm going to be deaf by the time the, <laughs> by the time I'm done doing what I do with these streams and I retire, I will, I will no longer be able to hear from all of the ABK bombs that are ringing in my ears. I actually have been de I actually am dealing with uh, tinnitus, which seems to be getting worse, unfortunately. So it sucks. But as long as I have some white noise on in the background, either from my phone or the TV, I'm usually good. But uh, yeah, laying in bed at night is the worst. When the, it's just quiet and there's nothing on, that's all you hear. God forbid I turn over on my left side or my right side where my ear is pressed up against the pillow and it's even worse. Uh, Barry MK with the five bucks. Thank you very much. What enemies turned friends was more fun to see? Rock and Mick Foley or Vince and Stone Cold? Rock and Mick Foley. It's not even a question. Rock and Mick Foley. The Mount Burning Kid, Christopher Bennett with the five dollar super chat. I think the big ricochet push is WWE's answer to AEW's Will Ospreay. I don't care. Just seeing Ricochet get spotlight is great, in my opinion. Safe trip to Phil. Yeah, it could be. But again, the the cynic in me is just like, all right, what what are they setting him up for here? Why why is he racking up wins on TV? It must be leading to something where somebody else is going to be coming in and they're going to be beating him and getting the real push. Can't help but think that. Prince Vegeta says WrestleMania 19 is my all-time favorite. That was a pretty loaded WrestleMania. Right, you got Angle and Lesnar, Michaels and his return match, his his return WrestleMania match uh, against Jericho, which was excellent. Hogan and Vince, Rock Austin three. Uh, was there one more big one that I'm not? I guess those were the key ones. I thought there was maybe one more. Um, no, I think those are the ones. Those, those are the big matches. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. Triple H and Booker, we won't talk about that. <laughs> we have a, uh, we have a new super chatter here. And, uh, she's going by the name Dixie Normus. Dixie Normus. Mm-hmm. Where is Abu Siko when you need him? I don't know. Abu Sika, he, he's got a super chat dedicated to him. I'm just saying, it's there. It's there. I don't know where he is. BCOM, see clearly, John Moxley was the only person not at fault. Hashtag Mox. Not at fault. Are we still talking about Punk? John Moxley is just like, man, I don't, I'm just, I'm just trying to go to work. I'm just trying to do my job, man. I don't want to be involved in any of this shit. Chris Mike Sell says, wanted to give a shout out to my brother, Louis Garcia. His birthday today, he has been listening since 2012. Got me into the podcast shortly after. Thank you. Well, Chris, thank you for the $4.99. And Louis, I want to say happy birthday. I assume that means today, Tuesday, and not Monday is his birthday. But either way, uh, Louis, I hope you have a great birthday. And thank you for listening to me since 2012. We got a long time, a lot of long time listeners here tuned in tonight. Got one from 2012, one from 2013. Let me see in the chat. How many, how many of you have been listening for a long time? What year did you start listening to the sound of? Because we also have some newer viewers who only watch me, like from YouTube in the last few years. But I know we got a lot of long time listeners tuned in here. So very cool. Barry MK 400. 
Can you add Bender from Futurama to be the booker? I am not going to do that. But I do appreciate the super chat. I actually cut out a lot of that stuff. Because we had like a bunch... Like Hall and Oates was in there. Like I put a bunch of like silly ones in there. And then people complained and... Yeah, I get it. So I took a lot of them out. A lot of the, a lot of the poison pills are uh, out of Be The Booker. Wow, look at this. 2013, 2010. ABK! 2013. I was wondering how long ABK has been listening for. 2013. For ABK. Boy, a lot of 2013s I see. You must be from uh, TV Tracks, all you guys. Boney with the five bucks. What do you think it is about Sheamus that he did not get over well early in his run with WWE, but got over around the last few years? I think a lot of it in the last few years has to do with people just uh, him being a veteran now and people respecting his work. When at first, I just think they they weren't necessarily fans of his work. Um, he's also been a babyface in recent years. But no, I think him being around for so long, it's kind of like the Miz thing, where now Miz has been a babyface for a while. And I just think that people have a, a certain amount of respect for them because they've been around for so long and because they've wrestled everybody there is to wrestle and they've put the time in, they put the work in. You know, he goes in there, he has stiff matches, you know. you Like, he goes in there and it's like he's in a fight. You know, it's like a struggle when he's in there. And I think that people appreciate that. They appreciate the style. They appreciate everything he's put in for all these years. Um, now, that's the reaction you saw at Clash at the Castle at the end of the match with Gunther when they gave him a standing ovation. I really think that that is his sort of peak moment. Watching him get that reaction in Cardiff in front of 62,000 people after that match, which was the WWE match of the year, in my opinion. I think it just boils down to respect. Uh, MLK 010. Cody versus Roman. Bloodline rules is giving me Backlash 2000 vibes when Rock fought Triple H in the McMahon-Helmsley regime for the WWF title. And if you remember the end of that match, that was actually a great match. With one hell of an ending. I wouldn't mind that. Vampira's Coffin. 2007. Been a Sala Monster soldier since day one. Wow. You realize that in November, it is going to be... Oh my god, I forgot. Is it 17 years? <laughs> I've been doing this so long, I forgot. We just had the 16 year anniversary, right? Okay. So in November, I think, it, it's the 17 year anniversary of the podcast. Does that make me like Seamus now, where I'm going to start to get the uh, like the babyface pop? People are going to start to respect me, finally. It only took 17 years. <laughs> are people finally going to respect me? Uh, Mac Tub says, favorite wrestler not named Hogan or Brett? Savage. ABK, there it is. That's why I said we're gonna we're gonna wait and not spoil it because I could not see the uh, dollar amount when it initially came in. But my God, four hundred eleven dollar super chat from ABK. Four hundred eleven dollars and ninety four cents. I know one person who respects me. <laughs> Holy shit. ABK, I say it all the time. I, I don't know what to say. I feel like I'm not worthy. Uh, he says, let Cody win. Also, I was 15 years old when I found you solo. Now I am 26. I'm old. If you're 26 and you're old, what does that make me? Don't say that. ABK, thank you very, very much. I appreciate it more than you know. A shout out to Todd. 
He has been a channel member for 16 months. He's got a red skull. He's wor he's trying to work his way up to blue skull status. That's the new uh, 48 months and above badge. So you had your podcast before Busted Open, he says. Uh, yeah, I mean, when, I don't know um, offhand exactly when Busted Open started, but I'm pretty sure it was long after 2007. I started before most people that are doing podcasts. Uh, there are a few that predate me. I'm not. I'm not the first. I'm not the oldest. But I'm. I, I think it's safe to say that I'm one of the OGs. So uh, yeah, longer than them. Longer than a lot of people. And still going strong. Willow v Willow. Idea for Hog. Mike Santana versus Santana Jackson versus Action Mike Jackson. Well, that's going to make it really hard for the commentators to keep saying that over and over again. I don't like that idea. Arabian Knight, how do you save Cross? Would a return to NXT like Corbin help him? I even thought Cross replacing Priest in the Judgment Day could work. I don't know. What is the best fix? I've said what the best fix is. What I feel like the best fix is. I feel like the best fix is to get away from the spooky stuff and all of the stuff that he's been doing in these different gimmick incarnations that he has had now for the last few years uh and you know try it try a situation where he gets to be more like himself and that might be as a baby face but like he and scarlet both in terms of them when they cut promos and giving them more speaking time um i think going a little more genuine and letting his real personality show through more than what they have him doing in these or, or, or maybe it's his call maybe it was his idea to do this type of gimmick i don't know um, I, I don't know that this is ever going to really change and elevate him to where he wants to be and before they just cut bait all together which i fear you know for his sake i fear like could very well end up happening if if this final testament stuff doesn't work uh, instead of just sending him back to NXT, which I just feel like, what does that really accomplish? I would just try something completely different with him. You know, I've heard him and I've heard him speak, and I've seen him and and Scarlet outside of the ring, off camera and stuff, and they're fun. You know, they're a fun couple to follow. You know, they got a good sense of humor. I feel like there's something there you can tap into from a character perspective on TV. So if that were me. That's what I would suggest. Uh, Cameron Spencer, thank you for the 499. Deathmatch wrestling fans are bloodthirsty, blood-sucking vampires. They should be ashamed of themselves for liking something so barbaric. Wow. Tell me how you really feel. You mean to tell me, Cameron, that you are no fan of GCW? Is that what you're telling me? Tribal Kev. Punk was never going to work in AEW. He found it out. Nova Kane with the five bucks. The guy with the pink Bret Hart jacket can be seen holding the Solo Monster Championship in the final shot of Raw. What? Are you serious? <laughs> you talking about tonight's Raw? I must have completely missed that. I may have turned the show off before I saw it. If somebody got a shot of that, send me a screen cap. I think we disconnected here for a second. And we're back. Had a little hiccup there. But Paul says that if Cody was smart, he would show the scene from Central Intelligence when The Rock was fat and dancing in the shower. The bullies threw him in the gym. I remember that scene. But I don't see how that's going to really help Cody going into WrestleMania. Barry MK, what's the worst WrestleMania theme song? Oh, uh, the worst WrestleMania theme song? Yeah, it's funny. Somebody on, uh, it might have been Reddit, posted. I, I love some of these fan made uh, videos they put together. They took the animated match graphics for WrestleMania 40 
but they set it to some of the old uh, pay-per-view themes and some old WrestleMania themes. And it's actually pretty incredible how well uh, Peter Gabriel's Big Time works. Uh, I love that song when they used it for WrestleMania 22. And it works really well, even for this year's WrestleMania. So that's one of the ones that I really liked. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know that there's one that stands out that I really hated. I think that they've, they've been using The weekend now for, like, years. It would be nice to just change it up a little bit instead of going back to the same band every fucking year. So, I mean, that that's kind of how I feel. Uh, we've got Holiday 197. Hey, Solo. I'm thinking Cody wins on Sunday. Uh, they have given him a beating twice now in a row without Cody getting one up. Feels that way. Barry MK. What was the better entrance stage in the Ruthless Aggression era? Raw or SmackDown? SmackDown. I mean, that's the SmackDown fist. Gotta go SmackDown. West Coast James, listener of the Sal O the Monster since November 2014. Yeah, James, James is uh James has been around for a while. James is one of the OGs for sure. TK Banks, Drew wins world heavyweight title at Mania, then main events clash at the castle and wins in front of his people. Yeah, Drew resigned. It's just almost impossible for me to believe that he hasn't at this point. But even if he hasn't, he's absolutely going to. I don't see any chance that he he leaves and and goes anywhere else. I would be I would be legitimately shocked if that happened. It's not happening. The Winston Slip says, "What's the highlight of the year in WWE for you so far?" It's been a short year. <laughs> the highlight of the year. I was at the Royal Rumble. That was my first WWE pay per view live in like five years. Does that count? I had a good time at the Royal Rumble. Uh, that was fun. Um, I mean, I geez, the highlight though, the highlight of the year. For me, I, it's that Punk McIntyre Rollins segment from last week. I just thought that was the best Raw segment in years. I thought that segment last week was fantastic. Ronan Mike Clips with a $10 super chat. I thought the promo that Roman did tonight was mid compared to the stuff The Rock has been doing lately. He has casted a large shadow over this whole angle. Or do you think that that is being done by design? No, I mean, honestly, a lot a lot of the Roman promos have, have come off that way recently. It, it could be by design. It's possible. Um, I don't know. Roman... Roman has his way of doing things, and it just, he doesn't really leave that comfort zone. He's just sort of, it's just kind of like paint by number stuff. He'll get off a few good lines every now and then, but I don't know. It's the same thing. You know, nothing really gets him rattled. And uh, Winston just gifted five channel memberships. So that gives us five new channel members. The Winston Slip. According to this, it looks like the Winston Slip has also gifted memberships here to Brian Alex, to Stefan, to himself. What? <laughs> it looks like he, what? That's what it says. Well, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Uh, let me uh, mention a couple of things here, I, and I am going to get to be the Booker, uh, because the goal tonight for be the Booker was 450. We are currently sitting at 677. We can get to seven, right? You guys can. Be, 700 likes should be a given. Hit that thumbs up. Let's see who's going to be number 700. But while we uh, while we wait for that, uh, I do want to mention one thing here before we move on. One of the things that I will be uh, partaking in this week, I'm very much looking forward to, on Friday at 3 p.m. There's going to be a lot of events going on, WrestleMania weekend. This will be the first coming up on Friday. 3 o'clock, Wrestling Revolver and House of Glory are hosting a show in Philadelphia. I will be there. 
And we got some big matches on that show, including for the first time ever, Amazing Red against Mustafa Ali, Mike Santana, and Alex Shelley, champion versus champion, title for title, and a whole lot more. And it will be airing on Triller TV, which is the former Fight TV. You could actually uh, buy the show standalone for $9.99, looks like. So if you can't be there live, which would be awesome, but if you can't be, you can order it online. Should be a great show. It is uh, in Philadelphia coming up on Friday at 3 o'clock. And uh, before we even get there, for those of you who may have missed it at the beginning of the stream, this I am very excited about. I got I me, mean, I got back to back days, and I'm I'm pumped, man. You know, The Rock comes out on Raw, he stands there on stage, and he shows you his arm, right? He puts his arm out and he goes, mm, goosebumps, right? All right, well, I got goosebumps. Not right now, but I got goosebumps because on Thursday, myself and Mark Henry, the world's strongest man, yes, Mark Henry, is going to be joining me for my WrestleMania predictions. And that is going to be in Philadelphia. We are going to be at the Duncan Music Lounge, which is at the iHeart Studios. It is in the Philadelphia area. There is very limited space. Uh, if you think that you may be able to attend or would like to attend, uh, I am going to have to hear from you first. Be sure to reach out to me, tweet me, email me, let me know. Give me a name so I can mention it and make sure there'll be enough room. But uh, it would be cool to see some of you guys there. But yeah, this is going to be a fun one. We're going to go over the WrestleMania card. We're going to do predictions. You know, Mark has been part of a few WrestleManias himself. WWE Hall of Famer, class of 2018. This is the first time he and I are going to be uh, linking up, and I'm very much looking forward to that. That's how I'm going to be kicking off my WrestleMania weekend in Philadelphia on Thursday. So, yes. Very, very cool. Is Mark Henry still with AEW? Yes, he is. Mark Henry is with AEW. Oh, he's back again. He's back again. He is back again. It's a party in here. It's a party in here. We're having a party here on the street. We're Barry Horowitz. We are indeed. We are indeed having a party. 1 p.m. Eastern, by the way. I should have mentioned that. 1 p.m. Eastern. Not sure uh, if it's airing live. It's not airing live on my channel. What I'm going to do is make sure I get the video for you guys so you can catch the uh, the predictions and everything. I'll have that up on the YouTube channel probably sometime later in the day on Thursday. Uh, so you will be able to see it. Uh, it may be streaming live on their uh, channel. I'm not 100% sure yet. Uh, but I will make sure that at some point before the day is up, you guys can uh, check that out if you cannot be there live. ABK just dropped a $205 Super Chat bomb on my ass. It's ABK. Oh my Always God. Always be killing it. Holy shit. A $205 ABK bomb to follow up on the $400 ABK bomb. And ABK, ABK is usurped by no one. He is staking his claim says, I start losing hair at 20 years old. Now I'm bald. I'm old. <laughs> with beard, beard people, oh, with the beard, people think I'm 40 years old, he says. Hey, ain't nothing wrong with being with 40 years. Hey, 40 years old, 40, man. They say 40 is the new 30. People are living longer. They feel younger. You got nothing to worry about, man. Hey, ABK man, thank you for the $205 super chat. Fucking amazing. Holy shit. Oh, man. Winston, I see Winston's. It says, ABK, I can do this all day, he says. Yeah, 40, 40 is still, yeah. Where, where did this whole thing come from that 40 is old? Yeah, if you're 10, maybe. You're 10 years old, 40 years old. Look at all the wrestlers now who are wrestling well into their 40s and even into their like early 50s. It's like so commonplace now. Like most of the top names in the business are in their 40s. AJ Styles. AJ Styles is, I mean, he's as fucking gassed up as I've ever seen him before. 
I've never seen him bigger in my entire life. And what is he? He's also like 45. What, what is this? Oh my god. Oh boy. Oh boy. He's got some competition. We're having a party here on the street. Oh my god. ABK has got some competition from Uffman Entertainment. Dropping a $200 super chat bomb. <laughs> on the stream tonight i said i wanted to start april strong i wanted to start on a high note that's exactly what we're doing look at this and we even got dan with us here dan levitt bangkok wolves i don't know what that is but that sounds cool he just subscribed to the channel hit that sub button by the way if you are new here make yourself known hey oofman man thank you Thank you for the super chat, Bob. Man, Uffman, Uff, Uffman did not want to uh, let that go without making his presence felt here. And getting in that last word. Chris Mikesell. Chris Mikesell says, Can you, uh, oh, can you, uh, is that ask? Can you ask Mark Henry why he did not win the tag team titles with D'Lo? They were playing hot potatoes with the titles back then, and they were a cool team. I, I, don't, I doubt he even knows the answer. It was the Attitude Era. Titles changed hands like uh, people changed their underwear. Maybe not some people, but you know, most people. Title, titles were changing hands every week. Hey, Todd Warner, man, holy crap, gifting 10 channel memberships here. That's funny, I was about to say there were some memberships that, because the gifted ones, they expire after 30 days unless people want to renew them. And uh, there were a bunch that had expired, but uh, you guys are helping make up the gap here tonight. We're not quite there yet, but Todd and Winston, you guys are, uh, you guys are helping out a lot. So thank you, man. And welcome to all of our new channel members as well. Becom, see clearly, sorry guys, sobriety is hard, hashtag Becom, stay sober. Uh-oh. I hope that's not a bad sign. You gotta stay on that straight and narrow, brother. I hope everything's okay. Nobody said it was gonna be easy. It's definitely not. I know some people, and they've been through some uh, tough times, too. It is not an easy thing to go through, that's for sure. Uffman gifting five more memberships, man. Bring more people into the family. This is, a, this is a big tent here. We got a big tent. We want everybody in the tent. We're pitching a tent. We're, not me. We. We are pitching a tent. Everybody is welcome. Uffman, thank you. Hey, Raf, thank you for the two bucks. I'm short a few zeros, but thank you for your work. It is very much appreciated. All the same, I assure you. Thank you very much. Did I get everybody? I want to make sure I got everybody's message. I think I did. Uh, do I think WWE will split the tag team titles again? I think there's a pretty good, a pretty good shot of it happening this weekend. They certainly are uh, setting up a scenario in which that could happen in the ladder match. So I think it's very possible. I'm just not sold on uh, each division being strong enough to support it, but... I will say the tag team division, at least, is in a better position than it was a year ago. Let's be the booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to be the booker. We are currently sitting at 713 likes. Still going. Let's shoot for 750. It is time to be the booker. I know many, many of you are fans of this segment here. So I like to give it to you. I don't like to disappoint you. I don't want to disappoint my people. I don't want to disappoint my public. There it is. There's Raph Super Chat. Look at Tony Khan. Embracing Mercedes. All right, tag team be the booker. Let's kick things off with Sheamus and Drew McIntyre, the Banger Bros. That's what they called themselves, at least for a week. It didn't last very long. But they were the Banger Bros. 
both men with contracts expiring very soon. One is going to stay. I believe the other is going to leave. Seamus and Drew McIntyre are going to be taking on the team of The Rock and Sock Connection. Didn't somebody just mention The Rock and Sock Connection a few minutes ago? The Rock and Mankind against Drew McIntyre and Sheamus. It'll be a main event on, uh, on any show. I like that. Women's be the booker. How about we book ourselves a, a women's match? Women's division match. Sounds like a good idea. All right. Let's uh, start out here with Sol Ruka. Sol Ruka from NXT, who just recently came back from a torn ACL. That's been going around the Performance Center. It's been going around NXT for a while, those torn ACLs. I'm starting to think that it's contagious. Sol Ruka has an incredible finishing maneuver. I don't know that she will be able to use it for the entirety of her career. It's not easy to pull off. That's why, like, if I were a wrestler, I would pick a finish that, A, I could hit on anybody, no matter how big they are, and B, I can do it until I'm 50. Because I don't want to popularize a move, and then as I get older, I can't use that move anymore. Sol Ruka against Io Sky. Love Io Sky. We just picked her the other night. We had a we had a, a mirror match the other night. We had Io Sky against Io Sky, and here she is again. Look at that. Sala Monster with the eye poke of doom. <laughs> well, has to be a, a legal maneuver. Can't be an illegal maneuver. I'm not going to win the main event of WrestleMania with an eye poke. All right, two for two. We are now heading into the main event. It all comes down to this. Men's be the booker. We're going to kick things off with Jeff Hardy. We're talking modern day Jeff Hardy. So I don't know about this one. Jeff Hardy is, is not what he used to be. But he's got a name. He's still very popular. Jeff Hardy. Going to go one-on-one. -on -one with New Jack. <laughs> Jeff Hardy against New Jack. How are we feeling about this as a main event? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? What are we, what are we thinking here? I'm on the borderline. I don't know. Add a stipulation? Okay, you know what? That's a good point. I'm on the fence, so I'm going to add a step. I could go either way on this. I'll add a stipulation, then I'll make my final decision. Jeff Hardy, New Jack, they are going to have themselves an Inferno match. Inferno matches are never good. They're just not good. New Jack in an Inferno match is just it just a promoter's worst nightmare. It's that's an insurance company's worst nightmare. I would need to make sure Jeff Hardy is of sound body and mind if he's going to be in an Inferno match. I mean, the whole thing is a mess. The whole thing just doesn't work. I'm sorry. It would be an attraction though, that's for sure, but as a promoter, if I want to lose my license, then maybe I would promote that match. But, uh, yeah, no. That's that's not my main event. I'm sorry. We will have to try again next time. And we will be able to do that in less than 48 hours. Because the next time I am going to be live with you, uh, barring any uh, emergency streams on Tuesday... I make no promises, but the next scheduled stream is going to be Wednesday night. I will be live after Dynamite. That's the night before I drive up to uh, Philly. And we'll talk about uh, the AEW show. And there's going to be a lot of content coming to the channel over these next several days. And I hope you will 
Be tuned into that. Again, please hit that subscribe button if you are not already subscribed. We got fun stuff coming up pretty much every day of the week uh, in these next several days into the weekend for WrestleMania in episode 856 of The Sound Off. Check out episode 855, a fine two-hour podcast. If you missed it, that went up yesterday, including my Dark Side of the Ring review on Brutus the Fucking Barber Beefcake. Uh, so that is there for your listening pleasure as well. Hey, Barry, thank you for the final two bucks. Barry says, I love the Inferno match with The Fiend. Yeah, I can't say that I was ever a, a real fan of any of the Inferno matches. I mean, the first one with Undertaker and Kane was... It was an attraction because it was something I had never seen before. Until that lame finish where Kane, very obviously, they had to wait so he could put a plastic bag over his arm. And it's like, all right, you know. Undertaker had a cool dive in that match, though. Vader had run out there. He did a dive over the flames. Like, the visual of it was cool. But, I mean, there's... I don't know. I'm just not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of how dangerous it is. It just, you know, it just, it just doesn't make for a... It just doesn't make for a fun match, in my opinion. Hey, Devin, man, thank you for being a channel member for 35 months. Better Cena SummerSlam match that had Triple H as the guest referee. Punk in 2011 or Brian in 2013? Uh, I go Brian in 2013. I, I like the Punk and Cena match from Money in the Bank a lot better than the SummerSlam match. And uh, Cena and Brian was fantastic in 2013. The, the, the double main event on that show was Brock and Punk, Cena and Brian. Those two matches... I don't even remember anything else that happened on the show. I mean, it, that might have been the one that had a, an Inferno match, actually, with uh, Bray Wyatt and Kane, unless I'm thinking of 2012. I think it was 2013. I don't remember anything else that happened that night, though. Those two matches, five-star matches. Absolutely great. Yeah, Kane. He had a, he had a like a play. He had some kind of bag or something over his arm to protect him from the flames because he set his arm on fire. But it was like so painfully obvious, and it's like you know what? If you have to do that <laughs> and make it that obvious, and don't don't bother doing the stunt. It just doesn't work. Anyway, be well, stay safe. Thank you guys very very much. And uh, I will see you on Wednesday for the AEW Dynamite stream. ABK, Uffman, everybody else, man, you guys blew me away tonight. Thank you all very much. It means a lot. Have a good night.